Okay, good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to everyone who came. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online. I'm really glad we have a big crowd tonight. We have a really exciting meeting. Um, so in the first half of the meeting, we're going to have our usual short segments. We do have some extra updates. We have some exciting news about the GA. We also have some job positions that need to be filled. So. Um, we're also going to move things around a little bit. The observations that we usually put at the end of the meeting are going to take place in the first half, so that in the second half our special guests can take the floor. So as you all know, uh, our speaker, Professor Nick Cohen, is here tonight, and he's going to be presenting a talk on the surfaces and atmospheres of exoplanets. So the new members this month, we've got a few, William Harrison, Sheng Wei Lin, Patrick Sabourin, Martin Viala, and M.M. Van Calipati. Let's give them a warm welcome. And I think it's worth noting that three of these members are youth members. Yeah. So we do have some exciting news. Um, three of our members, very lately, were nominated for a, an Exemplary Service Award from the National Center. So, first of all, we have, I believe, Simon Hanmer. Yeah. Second off, Mike Magadam. And last but not least, Chuck O'Dale. Oh, yeah. So congratulations to you three. The prizes, I believe, will be awarded at the General Assembly this summer. So up next, we're going to have the usual segments. And please welcome Dave to the stage for his Ottawa Skies for the month. Okay, so let's take a look at the skies uh, for February. Hopefully uh, we'll have uh, fewer clouds than we've had recently. So a full moon is on uh, February the 11th. Now before you get too excited, uh, penumbral lunar eclipse is not quite as dramatic as shown in the pictures here, but it is a week tonight. So it starts at 534 and finishes at 953. Let's take a look at the next slide to see the amazing difference. <laughs> Okay, the, the, the left is the moon, the, on the right is the full eclipse, okay? This is where the, the moon passes through the outer atmosphere of the Earth. It's not, it's not uh, completely being blocked, uh, blocking the sun by the, by the whole Earth. We've got a number of, uh, of comets coming through our way this year, and uh, I have a few more in the upcoming months to, to present. Uh, this one's not particularly bright, magnitude plus nine. Uh, this one comes around Comet 2 PNK every 3.3 three uh, years, and uh, there's the, uh, the approximate path of the, uh, of the comet, and that may be a challenge for you folks to see if you can get some uh, pictures for our observations coming up. Mercury is basically not really visible this month. Venus is visible, as, as we have all seen, in the evening sky and Mars is visible in the morning all month. Jupiter is visible all month. Uh, so uh, it's starting 11-11 uh, right now and uh, by the end of the month it'll be at a decent hour to, uh, to get some pictures. Saturn is visible in the early morning. Uranus is visible all month in the early evening and Neptune is visible all month as well in the early evening. Iridium flares. Get them while you can. What is happening is that the Iridium Corporation is replacing this, the, their, uh, their satellites. The original satellites had a very reflective service that gave us the, the flash of light from the Iridium flares. They're replacing them with these ones on the right called the Next Satellite. And uh, they, they're not nearly as reflective. In fact, they don't expect to get any flares off of uh, these satellites. And I think it was a few days after our last meeting they launched the first 10 satellites and are there in the process of putting them into orbit. So I'm going to switch to the next slide. There's a bit of a video uh, talking about the process they're going through. Hopefully it starts. There we go. Nice. 
Chris Jones. I'm the Satellite Operations Manager for Renew Satellite. You're standing in the Satellite Network Operations Center. Here we are managing and flying the Constellation and also managing the ground network. We're doing 1,400 different command and control activities. Each activity is about 10 to 15 commands. So we're sending 15,000 commands every single day. One of the biggest challenges we're going to have to do, and we've done a lot of experience doing this as well, is what we call slot swap. We have satellites moving at 7.4 kilometers per second, 16,700 miles per hour. And we're actually rendezvousing with these satellites, if you will, every time we do a slot swap. It's like a delicate dance we do because when you're doing that, you also have to make sure we maintain service. So if you're taking one vehicle in, you take one out without impacting the user at all. So it's a very complicated procedure. This is our rehearsal number two. So we are exercising exactly what would happen for our first launch. Statistically, there could be millions of anomalies, and there's no way to practice for all of them. You want to be prepared for some worst case scenarios, things that we don't expect to happen for every single scenario that could hit you. Our satellites are designed for a five to seven year design life. We're going on year 18. What we did the first time is unprecedented. Most of the same people that did that first launch were still here, myself included. It's going to be sad to, to do over some of these new, because like I said, we've been flying them and their personalities and dealing with them for 18 years. There's certain ones that people despise, there's certain ones that people love. We have satellites that are probably children, and we have some that are just perfect angels. So they're all a bunch of kids, and the way people talk about them is, is different children. You love them all the same, kind of. Okay, so the, uh, the first uh, 10 satellites were launched and are, are being put in position right now. And uh, by uh, 2018, we expect the iridium flares to go away. Um, as, uh, as it says here, uh, the iridium flares are very, very localized. So if you're standing at the corner of Kent and the PN streets, on February the 10th at 5.37 and 33 seconds, you'll see a flash. If you're out in Canada or you're out in Orleans, you'll see a little flash. Um, in the upcoming months, I think in my April presentation, I'm going to show you exactly how you go about uh, looking this up on, online. In the afternoon, eh? Yes. Yeah, that's right. It may not be very bright. <laughs> the International Space Station, uh, best viewing date for that is February the 13th. Uh, by best viewing date, there's a lot of, lot of times you can see it. I try to f I pick ones where the, um, it goes right overhead. That's the easiest time to see it. And the maximum time um, view, uh, maximum viewing time. And I finish off with my cartoon of the month. Thank you. All right, so not wasting any time, we're going to welcome Al Scott to the stage for his 10-minute astronomy news. Thank you, Kelly. And next, there it is. So before I begin uh, the astronomy news, uh, I just want to put on my other hat as telescope loan librarian. Uh, and draw your attention to the nice telescope over there in the corner. This is our newest addition to the uh, Astronomy Loan Library for more advanced users. This is a, an Astro 6-inch uh, achromat refractor. Uh, beautiful scope on a, on a new uh, pier. Uh, and it's available uh, for loan to advanced users. Uh, so you can come and take a look at it after the meeting. So. <clears throat> This is an interesting news item. Astronomers have, for the first time ever, predicted the merger of two stars in our galaxy. The sky show is expected to happen in the year 2022. 
The merger will result in an explosion known as a luminous red nova. These rare events are more energetic than a nova, but not quite as strong as a supernova. Um, at magnitude 2, this event will be as bright as Polaris in the night sky. The target stars are located in the constellation of Cygnus, and the afterglow is expected to be visible for up to six months. Pictured here is the remnant of V838 Monocerotis, whose remnants are shown here, is another luminous red Nova candidate event. So this was thought to be the same sort of thing. <clears throat> the objects currently are termed KIC 9832227, uh, and they're currently uh, thought to be a contact binary, which means two stars orbiting each other such that their atmospheres are touching. Uh, the object was discovered by the Kepler Space Observatory as an eclipsing binary with a period of 11 hours. The binary is about 1,800 light years away from us, so it's not that close. But the interesting thing about it is the period of these stars has been shrinking since uh, 2013 when it was discovered. The prediction of the date was based on a previous Red Nova example, V1309 Scorpii, first observed in the year 2008. In this case, pre-discovery data was available, allowing astronomers to track the evolution of the object from 2001 onwards to uh, the NOVA in 2008. <coughs> V1309 was brightening before its explosion and is now stable. The Kepler data for this KIC 9832227 fits the light curve of V1309 almost exactly. And aligning the two light curves, the astronomers basically just predicted the date based on the previous date. So there's not a lot of physics behind their prediction, but it just seems like we're you know, if it's the same as this other pair, which it seems to look like, there should be an explosion in 2022 in Cygnus. So keep your eyes peeled that year. I don't have that number. I'm not sure what it is, but they're not very bright. Uh, they're, they're, they're smaller stars. They're not expecting it to be a big explosion, so I, I think you, you may not be able to see it with your eyes. Most Kepler stars are like 12 magnitude. Yeah. 12th, 12th -ish magnitude is probably correct. Uh, my second uh, news story is about fast radio bursts. Uh, I've reported on these before. They're, they're kind of enigmatic uh, bursts of radio waves. Um, FRB, Fast Radio Burst 121102, is the first fast radio burst source to have been traced to a visible host. This uh, radio burst was detected on uh, November 2nd, 2012, as the name implies, and is the only known source of repeating radio, fast radio bursts. These ultra-bright, ultra ultra-brief bursts of radio waves were first noticed in 2007 at the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. The bursts seem to be distributed pretty well everywhere isotropically in the sky, so astronomers don't think they're coming from the, the galaxy. They think they may be extragalactic, coming from, from very far away. And in fact, if you look at the frequency distribution in these radio bursts, it seems to indicate that they've traveled through billions of light years of interstellar, intergalactic space. And so the lower frequencies are trailing behind the higher frequencies because of interactions with the very, very diffuse plasma, the one atom per few square meters in intergalactic space. So obviously you have to go a long ways through such a diffuse medium to have any effect at all on what your radio waves sound like. So assuming they were all, these short bursts were emitted all at once and the stretching of the frequencies comes from traveling through space, these things have come from billions of light years away in other galaxies. Because they last for only a few milliseconds apiece, it's easy to miss them. Astronomers estimate there could be as many as 10,000 of these bursts happening every day that we could detect, but we've only detected 20 of them, 20 independent of them, I should say, except for the ones from this one repeater. Interestingly, a large group of strikingly similar radio pulses was seen in 2010 at the Parks Radio Observatory, and they were called peritons. Uh, but they were tracked to impatient Australian microwave oven users. <laughs> Opening the door before the microwave shut. The repeating bursts at uh, this particular FRB were first localized to the constellation Auriga, triangulating from the observations uh, at the big dishes. 
What they then did was they trained the VLA, the very large array of radio dishes in New Mexico, on, in that area of the sky, and they detected nine additional bursts from the source and were able to further localize it to within one-tenth of an arc second. But that still wasn't good enough to identify an optical source, one-tenth of an arc second, and they still weren't really sure what this might be coming from. So with this information, the astronomers then turned to the European VLBI array uh, and the Arecibo uh, Very Large Telescope to complete the search, localizing the bursts to a faint per persistent radio source in a dwarf galaxy two and a half billion light years away, uh, pictured here. A little smudge. Because the bursts are so short in milliseconds, we know that from causality and the speed of light, they must be originating from a very compact area, no more than about 100 kilometers in size two and a half billion light years away, the luminosity of that 100 kilometer region outshines all of the stars in its own galaxy for that brief instant when it's emitting. And this then echoes across the universe and we can detect it. So what causes these fast radio bursts? Well, really nobody knows. Up until now, the most popular explanations for these highly energetic events is that they're rare one-off uh, super destructive events or explosions like black hole explosions or neutron star mergers. However, because we have one that repeats, that's probably not the case. This particular burst suggests they could be associated with something that might be a mass transfer, say, between a black hole or a neutron star, or maybe a neutron star and a white dwarf companion, um, or perhaps some sort of exotic hyperflare in a, in a neutron star or pulsar or magnetar, highly magnetized neutron star. So really astronomers don't really know what it is, but for the first time we've, uh, we've linked it to an actual object in a, in a galaxy which has its own radio source. So something very energetic is happening there and we don't know what it is. So stay tuned for further information. This is, this is getting to be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Al. And um, that's really interesting. I remember a few months back we had a big presentation on fast radio bursts and how they worked and where they came from. So I'm glad we finally have an update on that. So moving on, we're going to welcome Brian McCullough. We have a little update for you guys about the General Assembly taking place this summer. Thank you, Kelly. Well, St. Patrick's Day is coming, so I thought I'd wear my Where's O Waldo outfit, so here we go. Yeah, listen, in case uh, not everybody's aware of it, uh, this Canada Day weekend, uh, Canada Day weekend this year, uh, we're hosting the General Assembly of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada right here in Ottawa at Algonquin College. So we're expecting a fairly good turnout from uh, people from uh, across the country. There are 29 centres of the RASC across Canada. So we, got, uh, we know we've got some indications that we should have some nice turnout from there. And we're looking for a really good response from the, uh, from the membership here so that we can uh, uh, show what good hosts that, uh, that we are for the program, right? The, um, it's a kind of a maple-flavoured uh, General Assembly being Canada's 150th birthday. We're not officially hooked up with the Canada 150 program at all, but we're doing our own, uh, our own version of it. So we have lots of, uh, lots of interesting things on the go there. Uh, Chris, thank you if you go to the uh, schedule there. All right, uh, so we're running across uh, four days. We start on the Thursday evening. That's basically getting people in, uh, into the residence uh, just off campus at Algonquin College. But uh, starting on Friday, June 30th, uh, we've got the welcomes and the, uh, the keynote, ad keynote address. So our keynote speaker this year is uh, Ken Hewitt-White, who you probably know from uh, Sky News Magazine and also uh, Sky and Telescope. Uh, he was a member of the Ottawa Centre, get a load of this, during Canada's centennial in 1967. So this is, there were just too many good connections. I know he's got good pals, all these old uh, grizzled characters sitting up in the back there. <laughs> what, 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 right? Good thing I can't see you, right? Anyway, so he's, uh, Ken, Ken is looking forward to, uh, to seeing some of his old buddies and also meeting some, uh, some new people. He says he's, uh, he's putting together a really crackerjack uh, opening uh, presentation for us. Are you okay? Okay. 
Yep. So then, uh, and then as you can see, we're going to have the uh, Algonquin Radio Observatory. Uh, we've had some contact with them, uh, and uh, so we'll get a bit of information on what's going on there. And I know one of the things that uh, we'll be talking about at some point is uh, possibly doing uh, uh, tours led by uh, Ottawa Centre off on field trips, and maybe Algonquin Radio Observatory might be one of the good ones. Uh, Downtown tours, we're still sorting this out. Uh, we had a nice meeting on uh, Wednesday evening at Chris Heron's house, and the idea was just to, I uh, wanted to bring in just a couple of uh, the key players just so we could get them launched uh, with the activities they're doing. Uh, Kelly was one of them. Uh, Karen Finstad was the, uh, was the other. Karen is going to be putting our, our event program together. So I wanted to get those things uh, squared away. And by talking about that, we squared away a few of the details about talking to Carmen Rush uh, a bit uh, back and forth in the last day or two, just to fine tune some other things that we're looking at uh, that, that we're looking at doing there. Panel discussion uh, on the Friday, uh, we came up with a topic. What was the topic? Uh, how to make young members. That's right. It's how to attract young members into the RASC. So Kelly's going to be on the panel, and uh, so I think this is going to be a good topic. I know she's got some of her uh, friends here, and uh, I, I saw a lot of uh, younger faces. The, the younger faces who are not the grizzled people sitting in the back, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. So then, uh, and then uh, Kelly will be involved with the panel, and also uh, d giving us a little. Uh, I know she did a presentation a while ago on her uh, very uh, neat cookbook. Do you remember her uh, astro astronomical dessert cookbook? Yeah. Well, here's the. I'll cover this up. Uh, we're not allowed to serve samples at the at the GA because we can't bring any off food or off campus uh, food into the into the presentations or anything like that. But she'll. Uh, I think she's going to have some of her books available for sale there at the uh, at the GA. For the, uh, on the Saturday, uh, we've got Pierre Martin, and you remember Pierre, uh, mainly from his meteor work, meteor observing, photography, that type of thing. This is what he's going to be focusing on during that, those two periods there. It'll be uh, a presentation and something of a workshop where he can show people how to set up their, uh, uh, their gear. He's going to bring in his gear and show us how he does a setup for doing his, uh, his top-notch uh, meteor observing. Uh, Simon Hanmer, we've got uh, just ahead of the uh, the lunch break there. And Simon, can you tell me the title of your? It's, the, it's a geological perspective. On the, it's the solar system, a geological perspective on current controversies. All right. And who would have thought that Simon Hanmer would bring anything of a controversy? <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying, right? So this is this is going to be good. And. What we're doing with the people that we've got here, I mean, we have so many great speakers in the center, uh, but we've got a, a finite uh, area in the schedule, so I'm picking some key players that, uh, that I thought would be nice to uh, basically to show off eh, uh, across the country. All right, uh, over the lunch hour, at, oh, Gordon, did you talk to uh, that other little thing we discussed for possibly leading into the lunar sketching? She's waffling, but we're trying to... So where we have Simon Hanmer there, and then we're going into lunch, and there's a moon sketching activity. What I'm trying to do is maybe get like a two-minute, three-minute observation report from uh, young Julia Webster, since we're focusing on the panel discussion, right, for, for bringing youth people in. All right, so uh, Julia, how old's Julia now? Uh, she'll be eight in May. Oh, so one of the older hands, okay. All right, so what I'm hoping is that she'll want to play, come and give one of her lunar sketch presentations. No, okay, grizzled and grumpy. Because over the lunch hour on the, on that Saturday, that's Canada Day. Don't forget. Uh, do you remember that uh, that activity we did? I guess it was at the Science and Tech Museum. We set up two easels. One had a picture, uh, a map of the moon, and the other one had a uh, a blank circle. And uh, we had different uh, drawing materials there. And we invited people to come up and have a look at the chart there, and oh, try their hand at sketching. And what we did was we built up our own map of the moon. And uh, what Eric Kuala here did was he videotaped the whole thing. And then later uh, he, he puts the whole thing together and he speeded it up. So we could watch this whole thing, da 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 you know, one and only serial here. And, and there it was going at a million miles an hour. And you see this moon map, people walking up, doo -doo -doo. it's like something out of a Charlie Chaplin movie, building it up. Uh, we probably shouldn't be broadcasting this across the country because we don't want to tell people what, the, what it is just yet. Too late. Too late. Oh, too late. You can, you, you can edit it out. <clears throat> All right, so that's what we'll do over that lunch hour. So people can wander in and sketch. And I think uh, if Gordon's around, he'll, he'll probably be monitoring that, that project. We have a Ruth Northcott lecturer, uh, one of the required elements. It's like a, a skating uh, competition here. It's a required element. Uh, it's a, uh, the RASC alternates. They have a, a Helen Sawyer-Hogg lecture one year, Ruth Northcott lecture. And these are memorial lectures after 
a couple of women uh, who did, a, a, I hate to use the word stellar work, but that's what it was. They did stellar work and, and good groundbreaking work for, uh, uh, for the RASC, for astronomy in general, and, uh, and, for, uh, and for getting women into, uh, into better positions uh, in, in the sciences. So our Ruth Northcott lecturer uh, is a male, actually, all right, <laughs> Dr. Eric Steinbring from the uh, National Research Council out in, the, out in Victoria. And he's done a lot of work in setting up telescopes up in the Arctic, setting up small telescopes. He's been involved with uh, uh, looking at the sighting opportunities for the 30 meter telescope, that type of thing. So he brings a lot of different perspective uh, into it. So that's gonna be, we're really looking forward to that as well. Uh, we've got an outreach activity. We're still putting, uh, we're still deciding what that's going to be. Uh, for uh, because we're having a reception afterward and depending on how many people we have from the public because it's a public lecture for the Ruth Northcott then we'll uh, uh, we will have the uh, people who are not delegates go off to uh, a separate room actually the room where we have our annual dinner right at Algonquin College and we'll be doing some kind of outreach activity with them and the reason for that is uh, the main reason for that is uh, I, I wanted a strong uh, some kind of outreach element as part of this because I mean look at the work that that we do I mean look at the work well Mike hey, just got his service award you know for uh, you know have you ever seen him slacking off hey, for organizing the outreach this is what this center is known for I think is uh, is our uh, our very strong outreach element so we'll do something there uh, Charles Ennis, the National Secretary, has a, he's uh, producing a film about the, uh, the RASC. He'll be showing it there. Uh, we have a speaker coming in from the Canadian Space Agency. They've got a number of different aspects, uh, angles of things that they can uh, take with us, so we're still uh, finalizing the, the, uh, what the talk is going to be. Uh, Glenn LeDrew, who, and I forgive me on this uh, version, uh, thanks Chris for spotting that, uh, me, the editor, and uh, I misspelled Glenn's first name. There should be two N's. Uh, a number of years ago, he talked uh, about where we are in the universe. He, he situated us, uh, I mean, he could take us right from this podium and just put you where you are in the galaxy and which way we're looking at the band of the Milky Way and when we look at something a certain way. And it was a great way, especially for people who are uh, coming in new to astronomy, it, it just puts things into crystal clear uh, perspective. So that's what we'll do there. Uh, after, we're going to cut everybody loose for, for supper. It's uh, be, basically find your own meals. This is Canada Day. There are no services on board. At the uh, at Algonquin College, so I, I presume people are going to be most of them heading downtown for um, for the events downtown. Uh, Carmen and I have been talking about the the events we're going to try and do something on campus. And the more we were trying to finalize this, uh, we're finding things were not quite workable that way. Just in terms of uh, would we have enough notice for the a number of people who would want to stay on board uh, Algonquin on Canada Day, and so she could prepare a proper activity. But we'll we'll have something for them. At, uh, you know, no matter what uh, what their plans are. Okay, Sunday annual general meeting. This is what the in a sense this is what the whole game is about. Because if you look at the orange stripe down the Friday, that's where the national council rep representatives are meeting with the board of directors, and it's a national council meeting. So they're busy. So while people are doing fun stuff, they're busy. All right. So Rob, you're going to have to be busy. I might be off doing fun stuff. Okay. All right. So Rob Dick is our, uh, Rob and I are the two national council reps for the Ottawa Centre. Okay, so we have the annual general meeting, and then uh, following that, in, still inside the orange block there, the, uh, the board of directors usually is picking their new uh, committees in that for the following year. Uh, we have a guest program uh, just off to the side there, so if there are people who, uh, who have come a, a, accompanied an astronomer uh, a friend, and don't really belong in the annual general meeting, we're going to have something on the go for them there. It's another outreach opportunity. Uh, Carmen Rush, Carmen, uh, the, have you finalized your presentation for a title for that for uh, Sunday? Talk about his life and um, things probably that most people did not know about. Uh, and who was that? Charles Messier. About Charles Messier. So, uh, and Charles Messier, of course, is the uh, yeah, everybody knows about the uh, the Messier list. You know, and doing the you know fi uh, finding the 110 objects, making sketches of them, making notes about them, get your Messier certificate. And uh, uh, Carmen has uh, some different uh, different perspective on some of that. Uh, Rick Wagner, Rick, what's the story on yours? Have you uh, have you got a working title? Uh, probably um, taking the pulse of the stars. Taking the pulse of the stars, yeah. Okay, that'll be great, and you're also going to uh, give us a tour of your new observatory that you built as well, eh? I mean, a, a video or a... Yeah. Yeah, 
Okay, that's going to be great. A lot of people are looking forward to these things. Um, after coffee, uh, Janet Tollick, Janet and uh, actually Janet and uh, Gordon have been doing uh, a lot of astronomy art. Uh, they've been offering programs on that. I just saw, if you look at astronauts, go and look at this uh, issue of astronauts that just came out, and you'll see one of Janet's, uh, it's an M42 uh, fabric art. Now, this is not like your velvet stuff with the paint on it of a, of a wild horse dashing through the, the surf somewhere, right? It is so. Oh, is it? <laughs> You have to see this, and I really think there's the other uh, there's the other picture that should be shown uh, of the uh, oh it's, it's stunning I, uh, it's it's the uh, the Apollo 8 image of the view of the Earth from the Moon as the Apollo 8 astronauts in 1968 Christmas uh, Eve 1968 they went into orbit around the Moon they didn't have a lunar lander but as they came around the Moon and came back out to see the earth for the first time, they looked back and there was, there was the earth sitting there and Bill Landers on board that spacecraft started snapping uh, photos and he took that iconic photo. But anyway, it's, it's beautiful. She also has a, a, um, a working up uh, uh, an astronomy uh, photography exhibition, right? Out at the, uh, what's the name of the center? At the Shankman Center. Shankman Center. Shankman Center of the Arts. So, a uh, good opportunity there. I mean, look in astronauts because there's more information about that, and I think, Paul, you've written uh, about that as well. I, and, boy, the articles in this issue are really, really good. I uh, really enjoyed them. Uh, okay, on the solar eclipse, we have Ron McNaughton uh, from one of the other centers, and uh, Al Scott will be talking about different aspects of the uh, uh, solar eclipse coming up in, uh, what is it, August 21st? Is that what it is? Okay. Uh, okay. We got a little uh, block there, speaker's corner. We'll see if that, that's a little bit of a uh, fudge time, if we have time, if there are people who want to get up and give their, their two minute speeches about things uh, in general, we can do that if we've run out of time, which I'm, I saw a speaker's corner that went on in London and uh, some of those speakers, I, I, I'm thinking we might run out of time. We'll see, all right. Uh, then we're gonna take the break. People can go back and relax for a few minutes and come back out, we'll have the group photo and then we go into our, uh, our awards banquet. Now some of the other uh, GAs, what they've been doing is uh, handing out awards during the program, during the day's program, and uh, I was never a, f a fan of that, so we're, uh, we're not doing that. We're gonna, we're gonna have an awards banquet. We've got some, um, uh, we're in contact with some uh, other little things that will, be, uh, that will be surprises for the banquet, okay? Because we want some fun stuff there. Eh? Uh, Kel, we talked about some stuff at the meeting there on on uh, Wednesday night, so uh, we want to make it a really fun event. Our, award, our, our banquet speaker is Nadine Massé, and she's uh, a Quebecer, and she cut her teeth on Momigantic Observatory, uh, southeast of Montreal. So uh, she was actually involved when the, when the Momigantic Observatory was going to be shut down for, la you know, they were going to lose their funding, and I think she was front and center on helping get that back on its feet. She's out at Canada France Hawaii Telescope. At the, uh, she works more at the base of the uh, volcano of Mauna Kea, uh, but her, uh, her observatory, CFHT, is up on the summit. So uh, she's got some, uh, some interesting perspectives to, to bring uh, to us, including her uh, activities in out outreach, because she does outreach on the island there. It's, uh, I think it's going to be great. Um, on the, on the Monday, because it, our main program is done at that point, when we'll see uh, Chuck O'Dale uh, is offered to uh, lead a tour to the Holliford Crater, which is uh, uh, about an hour and a half, uh, yeah, I guess about an hour and a half south of Ottawa, southeast of, or southwest of Ottawa. All right, so we'll see what's going on there. Uh, it's, it's shaping up to be a really great program. Everybody's uh, pretty excited about it. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that uh, we're gonna be calling, we've had some volunteers step forward already. This is excellent. One of the other things we're, we're going to be putting uh, another call for volunteers coming up. If you want to talk to me t this evening about volunteering, that'd be great. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be instituting a walk you to your car program. Walk you to your dorm. All right. So I'm calling it the Guide Star program. All right. Ah, that's enough of this for now. Uh, I'm going to close. Um, uh, Tim and I created that, uh, that logo that you saw there. And uh, we turned it over to Jonathan Buchanan, one of the grizzled ones in the back, and he did this nice thing with that logo. Thanks, Kelly.
All right, so next up, uh, you may have seen in Astronauts, we have some job openings working for the center. So Carmen's going to come down and speak to those, give you a bit of a description of the jobs, and keep your eyes and ears open for this. You might find something you like. So hi, everybody. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, we have some uh, positions uh, to be filled in the club that are still open and uh, we're looking for some volunteers to fill them. Uh, none of these have to be done by one person, I just want to reassure you, so don't feel that if you're kind of considering that one of those looks kind of interesting possibly, that you're not going to be burdened with, first of all, a 10-year plan or anything like that, uh, or you won't be without help because um, uh, there's lots of resources and our hope is that um, a lot of these positions will be filled with more than one person, a few people. Um, and you don't have to be a long-time member to uh, be able to volunteer. Uh, just to give you a bit of background and some encouragement, um, I've been a member of the club since uh, 1984, and um, I've never regretted beginning to be more involved. Uh, I started first giving talks, but later I was uh, convinced uh, to uh, try a, a position on council. It was certainly not something I considered at the time, but uh, I was approached by uh, one of our, the fellow members, and he suggested that uh, maybe it would, might, might be uh, a good thing for me. And, and um, uh, like I said in Astronauts, uh, it certainly has not uh, been a regret of mine. Um, I did take that suggestion, and I haven't looked back since, and I've been a council member for a number of years. Uh, so I'm going to pass that uh, torch on to now somebody else. I'm going to do what that member did for me, and I'm going to try and encourage people out there to um, uh, step up to the plate if you uh, feel uh, like doing so, and uh, you'll be uh, warmly welcomed. So first of all, I'll just um, there's no um, description there of these um, uh, positions, so I, it is on astronauts, but I'll read it out again. Uh, so webmaster, uh, this person will help to design and do ongoing maintenance and updating of the center's website at ottawa.rasc.ca, uh, working with the newsletter editor to incorporate newsletter content uh, on an ongoing basis. Some experience, obviously, with management systems, especially Drupal, uh, would be very useful, and it certainly can be shared by uh, a number of members. Uh, flow director, this person will recruit and oversee a crew of volunteers, so we now see the flow director as being part of a team now, rather than one person, to assist with the physical and technical maintenance, security, and operations at the Fred Lossing Observatory near Almont. So if you're a regular out there, you might uh, um, join on in this uh, possibility of uh, being a volunteer, of a director or a co-director, um, and you can have so, a lot more input then about what's going on at, uh, at that site. Uh, light pollution abatement coordinator, uh, this person uh, will set up and implement a program to collect and distribute relevant information um, on responsible outdoor lighting practices to both members and the public. Public Outreach co uh, Coordinator. This person will develop and implement a program of outreach events aimed at the general public, uh, schools, uh, and um, use promotion on our website uh, and social media platforms, recruit volunteers and supervisors for the events in col collaboration with the Star Party Coordinator as appropriate. And the position, again, is best probably shared by a number of people because that's a, a large one as well. And uh, star party coordinator, this person will manage the logistics of a regular public star parties, including the recruitment, training, and coordination of volunteers, site management, including permits and insurance and so on, and assist public outreach coordinator with the um, promotion of these events. Uh, the position may be shared by more than one Ottawa Centre member. And of course this has been uh, uh, taken on by a number of members in our club, so it's never going to be a case that you're going to walk into one of these positions if you uh, think you can help out, uh, where there'll be no resource and you can't get any help at all and, uh, and guidance. So if you need any more information, uh, more than what I just uh, described, uh, perhaps see our President Tim Cole for more information and hope to see uh, some of you on board. It's a lot of fun. Like I said, uh, once you start volunteering, you really feel much more a part of the club and uh, get to know a lot more people, and it, it has a lot more uh, meaning. I can speak to uh, that from experience. All right, so without giving too much away, we're going to be sending out a survey in the next couple of weeks. And so, Tim, oh. are you going to come down and speak to that? Oh, 
So Tim's going to explain uh, the big parts of the survey and what we're trying to get from it. I forgot you needed me now. Um, that's all right. It's just me being old and grizzled. Um, okay, folks. Um, we will be producing a survey. Yes, I know, I know. Everybody sees surveys, and the last thing you want to do is see another one. I trust you will be happy to fill out ours because we are not trying to sell you low-priced tours of the Mediterranean as a galley slave or anything like that. Um, what we're trying to find out is what do we offer all of you folks, including the folks who are seeing us streamed. Um, we've done a really great job of outreach over the years, and I'd like to see us do a better job of inreach. Uh, so we'll be trying to find out what do you guys and ladies and youngsters and everybody else, uh, what do you want? What do you need? What, what, uh, what, what's going to warm your cockles of your souls for, uh, for astronomy? Warm your astronomical cockles um, and muscles alive. Never mind. Shut up, Tim. Um, so uh, we have not quite finished the last details on the survey. That will be done in a couple of days. Uh, but what we will be asking you in general is, what stuff do you use that's provided to you from both the center and from national? What stuff do you think is absolute rubbish and suitable for putting in the parrot cage? Um, what stuff would you like to have? What stuff would you, would you be willing to bribe me, uh, pay extra money for? Actually, no, um, sorry. Seriously speaking, one of the things we're really trying to do is make sure that you get the best possible value from your membership dollar because we're all scraping to, you know, to support all the stuff we're doing. We want to make sure that we're getting what you need. We will be asking you about facilities, and um, there are some big changes coming up in facilities in the next little while, uh, and a few that I, I can't say for sure are going to happen just yet. I will keep you posted. We'll all keep you posted on what's happening over the coming months. I'm hoping we'll have some good stuff. Uh, I hate to sound mysterious, but there's some real early inquiries to be made right now, and well, we'll see how those shape out. But we really need to know what do you need for facilities? Are you interested in using a dark sky site? Are you interested in astrophotography? Are you interested in having people within the center who are old and grizzled helping those of you who aren't old and grizzled? Um, we've recognized that there's a bit of a change in the way the club works. It's no longer a bunch of old geezers coming together sharing war stories about astronomy. There's a lot of people that are coming in that are saying, I'm looking up in the sky and I haven't got a clue. Where do I go? And um, we want to make sure that we're, we're dealing with that. So what is it that you want from us? Uh, I really do encourage you to do the survey for us, please. Uh, we're trying to keep it as reasonable and simple as possible. It is anonymous. Well, they tell me it's anonymous. Uh, you never can tell with this IP address stuff. Anyway, I'm an old geezer. Seriously speaking, it's anonymous. Um, we do welcome anything that you've got to say. You won't be able to, uh, of course, provide a lot of input on the survey because, you know, a lot of uh, unplanned for in, uh, input on the survey because that's not the way they work. But I will point out to you that if you've got an idea for something you want, or if you've got a grumble about something that you don't want, um, send us a note. Uh, you can send me a note. Um, honestly, as long as you're not insulting my ancestry, which actually I don't really care about that, but anyway. Um, you know, really, as long as you're not being uh, nasty and abusive, we don't care. If you've got an issue, bring it up, please. If you're not comfortable um, giving your name, don't. You know, uh, you know put it through joeblogs at gmail.com if you want to do that. It's not important. Just please let us know. And that survey is the first step in figuring out what can we do better and what do you guys want. What do you people? When I grew up, guys was by was unisex. Uh, I gather a lot of people don't find it that way. So never mind. It's not just all people with uh, X and Y chromosomes. It's people with whatever. Uh, it's guys, people, humanoids, whatever. Um, so whatever you astronomy humanoids want, um, <laughs> let us know. And that's our first step. So please do it. 
even if you want to scrawl, send a message to us saying, don't ever do that to me again or I'll find out where you live, that's, that's good too. I mean, you know, honestly, if we're bugging you with it, then for crying out loud, tell us. But please do not suffer in silence. Um, come, bother me. Uh, my skill at martial arts is non-existent, so you don't have to worry about anything but that either. Okay? So please, let us know. We're here to, ignore, uh, to listen to what you have to say. Okay? Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Tim. Uh, so we're going to jump right into observations. Tonight we have Roman once again. We have Paul Kleininger, Oscar Echeverry, Eric LeMay, and John Thompson who have some photos to present. So we're going to whip through this pretty quickly, guys. Okay. So as usual, I'm going to speak for Roman. Uh, this picture is a panorama he took, I believe, with his phone. And like a... Like last month, this picture was taken at solar noon, I believe at 11.50 a.m. on January 14th. So that's the highest the sun ever got that day, which is not at all. So we actually, <laughs> Chris and I got kind of confused because we thought we could see the sun right here, but that's really just the street light. <laughs> The sun is off to the horizon over here, and it's just below the horizon. Oh. Chris? <laughs> oh. Okay, so just to finish up, this picture was taken in Arctic Bay, which I believe is the third northernmost community in Canada. So for them, from November 12th to January 28th, this is their every day. The sun doesn't rise at all. So in that picture, he notes that the sun is 2.7 degrees below the horizon. So that's all for me. Paul, you're next. Mate Sky. Mate Sky. <laughs> oh, there we go. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, shots for you um, today. Uh, I've uh, included a few, a couple of other slides just to put things in a kind of an interesting perspective. So, I'll start with this one. Uh, as uh, probably familiar with what you're looking at here, uh, this is the Andromeda Galaxy on the uh, top uh, left and our own Milky Way at the, uh, the bottom right. Uh, the, the Andromeda Galaxy, I shot that uh, with a 70 millimeter APO uh, and the Canon 60DA. It's uh, about two hours worth of exposure, uh, 24 frames combined. And uh, the image of the Milky Way is a spectacular image uh, that I've, I've admired for uh, a number of years there, shot by Axel Mellinger, who uh, traveled to various parts of the world uh, to image the Milky Way in its entirety, uh, one end to the other, uh, using, uh, using uh, several different cameras and many, many exposures stitched together in a very complex mosaic. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of work, uh, one of the finest certainly that I've ever seen of, of, of our entire Milky Way. So wanted to put these in context. These are the two heavyweights uh, in terms of galaxies in, in our local cluster. Uh, our own Milky Way is about 100,000 uh, light years across. Uh, Andromeda is a little bit bigger, uh, but they're comparable in size. And they are locked in a gravitational embrace. As most of you probably know, uh, we're on a collision course with Andromeda. And uh, Andromeda is currently about two and a quarter million light years from us. Uh, it's fairly close as galaxies go. And uh, we, are, we are headed for a collision in a, in a few billion years. So, to put that in context, now do you want me to click on this, Chris, or do you want to run it? There we go. This is a NASA simulation, NASA, ESA, and the Space uh, Telescope Science Institute, showing the evolution of our two galaxies over the next few billion years. So you can see 
the simulation M33 up there as well. This is what's going to happen to our lovely galaxies. Can't, you can't fight gravity and gravity will eventually bring us together and cause uh, a rather disruptive event, as you can see. As the galaxies uh, collide with each other, they essentially pass through each other, disrupt their stellar disks, uh, disrupt, disrupt their uh, spiral arms, shed stars out in all directions, and cause massive uh, uh, bursts of star formation in the core regions of these galaxies as, as clouds bump into each other, uh, nebulas bump into each other. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty dra uh, dra dramatic event. So I'm going to show the next one, which is, uh, I'm going to show part of this again, just in a bit slower motion so you get a sense for what's going on there. Oh, there we go. So just a bit slower there. You can see as the disks pass through each other, they, uh, they totally disrupt each other, flinging stars out into intergalactic space with uh, long tidal streams of stars forming these amazing tails. Stars colliding? Uh, it's, it's not believed that that's very common. Uh, the space between the stars is, is pretty generous, and uh, so essentially they pass through each other. It's almost, it's almost uh, ethereal the way they pass through each other, but the, it's the gravitational influence that they have on each other that causes this massive distortion and, uh, and flinging out of stars. So I've frozen it here um, at five billion years in the future, as you can see, as you can see our cores, the core of the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are in close proximity, and you have these enormous streamers of stars that have been flung out into space. Now this is a computer simulation, and while it's quite dramatic, it doesn't really show what's happening uh, with these galaxies when you, when you have a look in close. So my next shot, our sun is only supposed to survive another five billion years, so we are not actually going to enjoy this. Uh, probably not. In five billion years uh, from now, our sun uh, uh, will have gone nova. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll probably have an Earth that's, uh, if it still exists, will probably be a pretty scorched ball of rock by that point in time. So yeah, we, if there's anybody around, they're not going to have a ringside seat. Hopefully in five billion years we'll have learned to do the Star Trek thing. And we can, we can take this in from a safer advantage. Okay, so yeah, five billion years from now. Now, to show you what, what, what really happens when these galaxies merge, we don't have to look too far, uh, at least as far as galaxies go, uh, because there's a beautiful example uh, uh, relatively close to us, and that's uh, the antenna galaxies. I shot this. Um, I shot this uh, last year. It's a four and a half hour exposure uh, taken with uh, 11 inch uh, Edge HD, and uh, a couple of different cameras actually, um, uh, a couple of different CCD cameras, and it combines uh, an hour and a half of luminance data, an hour and a half of uh, RGB data, and an hour and a half of hydrogen alpha data. So a four and a half hour exposure in total. And what you can see here is the effect of this interaction. These galaxies collided, uh, well they started, they started moving in on each other uh, about 600 million years ago. And they did actually collide or pass through each other about 300 million years ago and uh, started flinging stars out in all directions. You can see the, uh, the, the massive tidal streams of stars that have been ejected from, from these galaxies as a result of the interaction. And what's really obvious is the activity going on here. You can see that these, I mean, these were two spiral galaxies. They're um, the, you know, m not too dissimilar from our own Milky Way. So in a sense, this is a kind of a a preview, a good point about not being here in five billion years, we get a bit of a preview of what's going to happen to Andromeda and our own galaxy when they start their interaction and when they start to collide. So 
what you get here is 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 massive, massive starbursts, uh, 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 bursts of uh, star formation. As as the galaxy, uh, galactic disks interact with each other, you've got nebulas in both galaxies, vast clouds of of, of gas and dust, and they basically get compressed and squeezed and start this 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 frenzied uh, this frenzied burst of star formation uh, in one of these galaxies alone in the last few years over five uh, five supernovas have been detected so it's very very active the disks get totally disrupted and uh, eventually what will happen in you know probably about three or four hundred billion years uh, mil million years rather is that these galaxies these disks will merge and form uh, a one large elliptical galaxy so yeah, that's the antenna galaxies. As I said, they're 45 million light years away, so visible through relatively small telescopes. The, the, the tails themselves require a long uh, duration imaging to, uh, to pick up. They're quite faint. Uh, but you can see these, they're in the constellation of Corvus. And just to, just to give you a really good idea of, of how active and disruptive this event is, I thought for my last shot I would include an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, its sharp eye really reveals the, uh, the nature of this interaction, and you're left with that. Quite stunning, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous sight. You can see this, this in region of interaction here, with these massive clouds being thrown out, uh, all of these bright areas here. They're just huge. Think, think of the Orion, uh, the Orion Nebula on steroids. It's uh, just massive star formation, big bright blue stars, heavy hot stars that uh, live only short durations and, uh, and tend to go up as supernovas there. But uh, I thought I'd throw this one in because it really, really brings the dynamics of, of this interaction uh, in, into focus. And this is, uh, <coughs> this, this is a common uh, thing with galaxies. I mean, a few decades ago we thought this perhaps was a bit more of a rare occasion. Now we've come to learn as we've examined these uh, uh, clusters of galaxies in different parts of the skies, we see that these, uh, these uh, galactic uh, interactions are, are very, very frequent and, uh, and uh, form, uh, uh, in the end, as I say, they form uh, large elliptical galaxies. So that's all I've got for you. Uh, have a good month. All right, well, speaking of interacting galaxies, uh, I'm presenting a shot of uh, Messier 51, uh, so that's the Whirlpool Galaxy, or NGC 5194. I'm not going to go into the details of interacting galaxies, because I think Paul gave us a pretty good breakdown there. Uh, I, was, I was half afraid that he was going to show an image of this, and it would be <laughs> like one of those awkward moments where you go to the office and you're wearing the same clothing as a coworker. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this was shot with my 8-inch uh, Skywatcher uh, Newtonian at f6 using a Canon 60DA. Uh, it's about an hour and a half of exposure um, at 3200 ISO and I processed it in PixInsight. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi everyone. So last month I showed this picture here, uh, or one similar to it and promise you guys a time lapse of this. Um, by the way, Tim uh, Cole, see me after the book. This I want to tell you something about this too. Um, anyways, uh, I think if I just push this button, it'll put. Oh no. no advance. Sorry. Go, go back. No advance. Okay. I have to play it for you. All right, hit it, Chris. This video is too big for PowerPoint to handle. <laughs> I've been uh, working on that actually with a new version of software. So. You can notice uh, there's very, very, very slight cloud cover. Um, and uh, Chris, if you could play that again. Um, you can see the, the cloud cover in the absence of the green uh, haze, essentially, which is basically uh, sky glow. So the whole sky had some, uh, or well, of what you can see here had some sky glow. But uh, the clouds are slowly moving by and give it a bit of a wavy effect. Also, you can notice that the moon just rose.
Actually, Chris, can you just play that again uh, in case somebody uh, in the audience... <laughs> but it's just... <laughs> Sorry. You'll notice just right at, at, uh, at an exact time that just poof, the whole, the whole dish lights up. And that's the, uh, the moon rising. And it was a very, very crescent uh, moon, so it was, it was barely perceptible. But uh, Yeah, I didn't catch that the first time I watched it either. But uh, in any case, uh, so the next picture that I've got... Okay, so I'll just look back here. Uh, on August 29th, uh, Taras Rybersky, um gave me a shout and said, "Hey, I want to go explore a bunch of new, a bunch of new places uh, tonight. Let's take a tour of the uh, southwest of Ottawa and see if we can find some new, new places to do some astrophotography." And this is uh, um, a location on the Madawaska River that he had uh, located, um, and it was uh, nicely located in front of a, a body of water that was really, really still that night. So. Um, I decided to uh, to take a few pictures here. Um, Twenty minutes later, after this shot was taken, here I am facing him. He's looking towards what the camera is seeing. I'm facing away, and uh, and I see his face light up, and his expression just is like one of complete shock. He's just like, and he couldn't he couldn't speak. Right. Next thing you know, his face starts lighting up, and I, I think like I don't know, some sort of like patrol boat is coming in. We're you know. <laughs> Except for it's completely silent, right? Um, this uh, this picture doesn't quite show it because a few seconds later, after this, uh, I guess you would call it a bolide event. Um, you know, I heard the uh, the shutter click again to start its new picture in a sequence for a time lapse. But what it did uh, capture right here, uh, this meteor right here, it ended up about right down here. So. It got brighter and brighter and brighter, and I'm not kidding you. This thing was brighter than the than a full moon. Um, and then it, it, it so this uh, this streak up here, it caught the first maybe two seconds in terms of uh, like it was a 10 second long event. This thing, as it as it raced across the sky, broke up into m multiple fragments, and they all were you could see them. It was like watching fireballs as they were turning over and over and over. And then finally, this thing just completely blew up, <laughs> and, uh, and you actually could hear it when it did that. So I thought that was pretty uh, pretty exciting, and I thought for sure I've caught the whole thing. I thought this was look like it would look like a big comet here, basically, right? So I was pretty disappointed when I heard my camera click to start the next frame, <laughs> and realized that I only caught a, par a portion of it, uh, because when I do my time lapse uh, photography. My pictures are only about 10 to 15 seconds long. So there's 20 minutes uh, in between this frame and the previous uh, frame right here. So you can, uh, you can notice that in this frame right here, the Milky Way appears about the same position as the next frame, but the ground uh, is moving. So um, what I did on this one here is I, uh, for the, the next uh, time lapse, I don't know if Chris, if you have to do that from your end there. But uh, I included some motion of the camera itself while I was uh, doing my time lapse. Um, Chris, do you need to play that or? Okay. So there we go. And sorry. Eric, what's the row of dots just above the trees on the left? Oh, that's uh, most likely a airplane. Um, there we go. What catches me on this one here is look at the bottom in the water. You can notice the reflection of the uh, the Milky Way and all the stars. And towards the end, I decided to pan upwards. Um, after this right here, my thank you. Um, after this, the clouds rolled in, and it was uh, it was game over, anyways. But. Uh, I just got to thank Taris for inviting me out that night because I probably would have stayed in and done something else I hadn't considered going out to do any astrophotography, but he called me up and said, hey, let's go. So thank you very much. Well, 
Uh, this little project was inspired by some of the talks that were given by Gord and Tim in the last couple of months where they were using a DVD, I think, to make a spectroscope. Uh, this is a prism spectroscope, and I said inspired, but I actually built this in 1981 plus or, you know, give or take a year. And I used, I shot a couple of rolls of black and white Tri-X film using an old Pentax K1000. And it got set aside after that and it hasn't been used since until I had to reconfigure it to make it fit by Canon uh, digital camera. And unfortunately I didn't get a clear night this, this week to try it out, but I did get some uh, a street light shots just to show how it works. But first of all, it, it uses two prisms that come from just basic binoculars. I, I acquired them at the Stellophane swap table. I got four prisms for a dollar, but if you have any junked, uh, like unworkable binoculars that are out of collimation, or, or you can find something like that at a flea market, you can take them apart. Or there are other sources of prisms like that. You can get them for a few dollars. But there are two of them located inside that uh, <coughs> container made of corrugated cardboard. And it's just uh, like a metal strap that holds it in place. So the next shot, this was taken last night. I was hoping to get uh, a clear night where we could get some stellar spectra. But the farther street light, that is about almost 100 meters away. And I found out that the spectrum was so bright that I was having to reduce the exposure over and over again until I got one that was acceptable. That's about a 1 20th of a second with the camera lens stopped down to half its actual <coughs> normal size. And you can see that those are high pressure sodium lights that most of the light is still concentrated in yellow, but you see a continuous spectrum with uh, a couple of other emission bands in the green and the purple to give a more or less uh, uniform spectrum. There's also a little bit of a ghost spectrum up to the upper left of that one. Now the thing is though that uh, the sites that talk use those DVD or CD type spectroscopes, what they don't say is those are really very inefficient. That I made a little, I was doing a few experiments and I would guess that they're probably no more than 10% of the incoming light goes into any of the spectra. Like most of it isn't diffracted at all and the other, the rest of it is, goes into at least six different spectra. Something like this, virtually 100% of it goes into a single spectrum. Uh, so it's probably close to 90% efficient. There'd be a little bit of loss from you know, the air glass reflections and if I'd used anti-reflection anti coated prisms, it would be over 90%. But historically, if you look at astronomical spectroscopy, with the exception of the sun and planets, most of it was done with prism spectroscopes like this. Some of them had as many as five or six prisms that, that was the case until the giant telescopes like Mount Palomar came along where they had lots of light to work with. But with the smaller telescopes, gathering that, sun, that uh, starlight was so difficult that you couldn't afford to waste any of it. So uh, I was hoping to get a picture of Orion because there's a nice selection of different stars. Rigel has some very nice hydrogen bands that are easily shown up in something like this that I captured like on Tri-X film years ago. Uh, Betelgeuse is a cool red star that that has uh, molecular bands in its atmosphere. I, I don't know whether I can pick those up, but I was going to give it a try. The belt stars are sort of intermediate temperatures, more like the solar type stars, yellowish. And then there's the Orion Nebula, which is an emission nebula, and it should again show hydrogen, except there'll be emission bands on it. But anyways, uh, I'll be writing something like this about how I made this in uh, the astronauts, and uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to come up with some, spell some stellar spectra for this. And I was thinking this probably make a good science fair project that if anybody's interested, I can, I've can, i got it here and I can show it to you and describe how it's made. Thank you. Okay, guys, so I'm sure you know I'm really ecstatic to have this great speaker with us today. I promise you, you're really in for a treat. So ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Montreal, Quebec, Professor Nick Cohen. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. This is good. Is the deal like with this camera, I'm not supposed to like walk around? Is that pretty much the deal? Yeah, okay, cool. 
So I'll, I'll try and stay more or less put. I'll just like pace back and forth a little bit. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always fun to talk to people who actually take pretty pictures of the sky because I do not do that. Um, in fact, I think you've already seen the most beautiful pictures of the sky um, that you're going to see this evening. So, so all I can do is show you cool pictures of things either taken from space or made up pictures that, that artists have made. Um, but none of these are, are, are objects that you can look at very well with, with your typical backyard telescope. And so, um, let's see, I should explain where I'm from. Okay, so I'm, I'm at McGill, I'm in this thing, the McGill Space Institute, uh, Institut Spatial de McGill, and also IREX, an Institut de Recherche en Exoplanète, uh, which is kind of a joint thing between University of Montreal and McGill. Um, and this was one of these wonderful, um, I don't know, we were kind of coerced into working together by a philanthropist, Laurent Trottier, who, who basically took the Crosstown rivals and said, look, I'm going to give you both millions of dollars, but the deal is you've got to work together and do cool science. And so we were like, sure, let's do it. Um, and so I was actually an undergrad at McGill University back in the day before the McGill Space Institute existed, before uh, Vicky Caspi actually came there and, and does famous stuff, including fast radio bursts. Um, and back then, I never set foot on University of Montreal campus, but now we actually work very closely together. And so we have this kind of fantastic, enormous bilingual group of people, and we get together every week, and it's good times. Um, OK, anyhow, that's the background. Here goes. So this is a talk about planets. And so I figured I should start with a certain planet that we know and love very well, and how do we study it, okay, and sort of the history of that. And then I'm going to gradually move further and further away, and I guarantee by the end of it, we'll be studying stuff that's like hundreds, thousands of light years away. So on Earth, the way things went down is people started by studying things locally. All right? And this is true both for rocks, like this geologist here, but also it's true of our atmosphere. Right? So people studied uh, meteorology. Right? They, they, all, they, they cared about what was happening locally. And then after a while, you do, if enough people do this locally and they talk to each other, with, with mail or whatever they did before the internet, then you can eventually construct something like this, right? So this is a map of England. It's a geological map. It tells you what kinds of rocks you find at the surface um, everywhere, or for most of, of England and Wales and Scotland, all right? And so you're gradually, you're moving to a slightly bigger scale, and that took, that took some time, right, for people to communicate and actually come up with a, with a coherent way of classifying rocks, let's say. But then, as time goes on, you go to even more global things like this, right? Where you have satellites and you have boats and you do lots of data and then you actually finally get a global picture of what our Earth looks like. And you can understand things like plate tectonics. You start putting the, you know, connecting the dots and understanding, uh, you know, earthquakes. Why do earthquakes happen in certain places? Why do you find certain kinds of volcanoes on certain, certain regions on our planet? Um, and the same story is true, again, for our atmosphere. Right? We used to understand our atmosphere in a very local way. You notice the weather was a certain way here. And then, after a while, you might notice, geez, it's funny, when my friend in Toronto says that it rained, then like, you know, uh, 12 or 18 hours later or something, it like rains in Montreal, right? And you start connecting the dots, and then eventually you get this global picture and you understand Hadley circulation, large-scale circulation. So the trend is always going from local, understanding things locally, to then understanding things globally. All right, so that's how it's worked on Earth. Okay, we started with local, small-scale stuff, and then eventually grew to understanding things on a global scale. But that's unique to Earth, because we live on Earth. All right? So every other object in the universe, really, that we're going to study, we're going to study it first globally, from really far away, and then only if we're lucky will we ever hope to understand what's happening locally at different locations, right? So distant galaxies or something, you know, at first we just see a speck. It's just a few pixels across, and you try and get a spectrum of that. And then gradually over time, you start understanding, oh, hey, there's stars forming in different regions and stuff. You kind of zoom in, okay? But it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit backwards from our thinking, okay? So, so I'm going to be talking about planets, and, and what I want you to realize is that we can understand we can ask big picture questions about these planets um, more easily than we can ask local questions. So it's easier for us to say that planet has plate tectonics, for example, than it is to say that planet has a certain kind of uh, rock on it. Right? It's easier to do the big picture stuff than the, than the local stuff. So it's, it's completely backwards, basically, from our intuition on Earth. 
All right, so let's start. You know, it's not really a, uh, it's not a planet. I would call it a world. So I kind of loosely use the word world to mean a planet or a moon. It's kind of like anything that's round and, and interesting in space. Uh, not stars, though. Um, and so, so this is this is the moon, right? And and the moon was understood um, pretty well um, in a global in a global view, right? You could see that there's bright spots and there's dark spots, and frankly, the that's really mostly what there is on the moon. I mean, the moon's not geologically terribly interesting. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, okay, I know that's, I'm offending some people. <laughs> but, but eventually, right, eventually, you know, we, we managed to send people to the moon, and then you can actually do geology, right? And so this was completely, this, again, completely backwards from on Earth, right? So, so the geology, you know, actually sending geologists to Mars, I mean, to the moon, took a really, really long time. Okay, hopefully it'll happen, we'll send a geologist to Mars in our lifetime. I, I have some hope. If we don't do it, well, China will do it. Okay, so that's, that's basically it. Um, exploration beyond, I mean, we haven't, humans haven't gone beyond the moon, right? So beyond that, like, we haven't sent geologists, we haven't sent meteorologists or anyone uh, anywhere, right? The furthest we've gone is the moon. So what do you do if you want to go beyond the moon? Well, use robots, right? And so we've sent robots. So here's one, here's our geologist on, on Mars, right? It's a robotic geologist on, on Mars, the Curiosity rover. This is the selfie it took. Um, and uh, you can, you know, there's, there's good science you can do with this. Um, it, ironically, send, you'd think a robot would be more willing to kind of risk a robot than a human, but it turns out robots are kind of clumsy. And because of the light travel time out to Mars and back, they don't have very fast reaction speeds. Um, so you can't do something like, say, you know, hike up that kind of steep hill and go take a look at that interesting um, slope because it looks like there might be some, like, salt water underneath it, right? So something that, say, the satellites going around Mars noticed, you can't just send the rover to check it out because it might slip and fall or hurt itself, okay? Whereas if there was a geologist on Mars, it'd be no big deal. you just say... Hey, Sally, can you go check out that rock? And she'd say, sure, that's my job. And then she would go check it out. And I mean, geologists are, are a pretty hardy bunch, and they're, they're comfortable, like, rappelling down the side of a cliff if they have to to get to cool rocks. Okay, but Curiosity rover can't rappel down a cliff, right? People are talking about doing something, robots that could do that, essentially, but we don't have them yet. Okay, so they're kind of conservative, the robots, which is, which is weird, because, like, you know, who cares if that thing dies? It's not really the end of the world. Um, but... But NASA cares, turns out. <laughs> Rocket scientists care. It's worth a lot of money. It's worth a lot of money, yeah. Yeah, a lot of money. Okay, so now we're going further, further away. So we made it as far as the uh, ringed planet, Saturn, right, with Cassini. And, and Cassini, Cassini's good. Um, you can do stuff like this. Okay, oh, sorry, here's my one. This is a real picture. I mean, I didn't take it, but like Cassini took it. So th this, is, this is the only beautiful picture I will show you in my talk, I think. Um, this is a cool picture, right? Because it doesn't matter how big your telescope is, if it's on the Earth, you will never see this view, right? Because you're seeing the night side of, of Saturn, right? This is the dark side of Saturn. The only reason it's lit up is because there's light bouncing off of the rings and illuminating the night side, right? So this is a, a truly otherworldly view because the Earth is never on this side of Saturn. We would be very cold if we were out there. Um, so that's cool. But, but from my perspective, as someone who like, really cares uh, you know, about planets, not, not, I'm not so much a pretty picture guy, um, what I was more excited about was the Huygens probe that went down into Titan's atmosphere and actually landed on the surface of, of Titan. Okay? Titan is really cool. Okay? So it's, it's literally, it's actually very cold too. Um, so, so there's mountains here on, on Titan. We actually think there's, there's cryovolcanism which means it's like volcanism, except the rock is actually ice. It's just so cold that, it's, that, that ice is actually rock hard. And then the lava is actually just water that comes out. So the water kind of oozes out, and it basically behaves like a volcano. It's just that instead of being rock, it's ice. However, if you look at this, so I showed this to my son earlier today, and he, he actually thought that that was lava. That's actually not lava. That's, that's a river, right? What you're seeing here are streams and rivers. Um, but the streams and rivers aren't made out of water because it's frozen. That's the bedrock, okay? Those are made out of methane, butane, 
right? There is hydrocarbons, which is kind of cool, right? So that's the liquid on Titan. And the, and the super neat thing with Titan is that it actually, the, the temperature and pressure is right around the triple point for methane, all right? So just like on Earth, we're near the triple point of water, so you see water and snow, ice, you know, vapor, liquid in all of its various forms. Well, it's the same thing on, on Titan, but for, for methane. And so you can get snow, you can get methane snow, you can get rivers of methane, you can get lakes, you see lakes of methane. Um, so it's a very interesting world. Again, I'm using the word world because it's not technically a planet, it's a moon. Um, but it's pretty cool, okay? And it's way too cold for life as we know it. However, you get some pretty stinking cool chemistry when you get this cryovolcanism right, because you have basically liquid water oozing out of the, the innards of the moon, and there's a bunch of hydrocarbons everywhere, like the, the lakes are made out of hydrocarbons, you have plenty of organic material. So I have colleagues who are, who are very excited about the, the astrobiological potential of Titan. Okay, where are we going? Oh, New Horizons, of course. This is kind of recent-ish. Okay, so New Horizons um, set off to go to a planet. Um, the planet got demoted. And uh, it's not clear whether we would have demoted Pluto, right? So I was in grad school when Pluto got demoted. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't actually in Prague at the meeting, at the IU um, meeting, but I had, some, I had some, some office mates that were there, and apparently basically no one went to the session where Pluto was demoted. It was kind of like, ah, whatever, the, the, the solar system dynamicists are having this big you know, debate about what qualifies as a planet. The thing that annoyed me as somebody who studies planets not in our solar system was that their definition actually excluded all of extrasolar planets as being planets. Yeah, yeah, it made me pretty sad. Um, so, or, or mad, or I don't know what. But anyhow, the point is, I don't think they would have demoted, I don't think the dynamicists could have demoted Pluto if we'd had images like this, okay? Because Pluto is actually kind of cool. It's a lot more interesting than, than it was when I was in school, right? Um, it's got mountains and stuff. It's got like lots of, it's more, way more geologically diverse than you'd think. And look at this, right? This isn't an artifact. These are wispy, hazy layers. It's got a freaking atmosphere, right? It's like a weird, weird, tenuous, seasonal atmosphere. But I mean, come on. This is, this is a very interesting world. Maybe, maybe qualifies as a planet. Okay. An atmosphere of what? An atmosphere of what? Gosh. Uh, nit yeah, nitrogen is probably, yeah, because if it's, everything else is frozen, right? I think even the methane would be frozen there. Given that Titan, at Titan, it's like at the triple point, so out here it'd be even, yeah, you're only left with nitrogen. So liquid nitrogen and solid nitrogen in this case. Gaseous nitrogen, fun. Okay, so beyond Pluto, what can we do, right? So beyond the moon, we send robots. Beyond Pluto, uh, you know, there's talk, there's talk of, of sending, you know, there's some billionaires who are big space geeks and would like to send a cell phone to, uh, to Alpha Centauri. That may or may not happen in our lifetimes. But I can tell you what always works for sure is using telescopes, which all of you are big fans of. So that's good. So that's basically, so the, so the rest of my talk, I'm focusing on telescopes. Um, and so I'm going to start, okay, this is not a real image. The, now I'm getting into the La La Land stuff. So this is just like artist's impressions, a lot of artist's impressions. So this is an artist's impression of Planet Nine, okay? So of course, Pluto used to be the ninth planet. In fact, I suspect, based on the usual demographics of astronomical clubs, though I realize that Kelly's doing a good job at like bringing in younger people, but I'm guessing that some of the, the people in the back there, the the older crew, probably think of like, well, Pluto's the ninth planet, right? Well, it, it was, yeah. And so then we used to talk about this thing called Planet X. And the X was clever, right? Because it could be X like the number 10, like if you know your, your Rocky movies and stuff. Or it could be <laughs> X like the mystery planet, like we don't know if it's out there kind of thing, right? So that was Planet X. But then once Pluto got demoted, um, that kind of left this opening for the ninth planet. And so then recently when people revived the notion of planet X, they called it planet nine, which of course really angered a number of different constituencies. A, it, it angered the people who still feel that Pluto is a planet. Um, and B, it angered the old school people who studied planet X because then they felt like you were changing their name. <laughs> so anyhow, suffice to say, this is planet nine. We don't know whether it really exists, um, but there's some, there's some circumstantial evidence that it exists. So, so these are orbits 
of basically ice balls that are just obscenely far from the sun. So it's, so it's hard. I mean, these are um, scattered disk objects, and they are um, much further away than Uranus or Neptune um, and Pluto, for that matter. Um, and what you notice is that they all seem, they're all on elliptical orbits. That's normal. Most of these things you know, tend to be on elliptical orbits. But the, all the ellipses are pointing kind of to the left here, right? They're, they're long. Axis is kind of out to the left. So Sedna was the, the, the famous one, the, the first one found. But all of these things have been kind of pointing in one direction. And so at some point, dynamicists, and this actually happened earlier, like before the, pub the public cut on, right? So this is actually, this has been happening for like four or five years, that dynamicists have been looking at these weird orbits of these ice balls and saying, this is really weird. Why are they all pointed the same way? Um, and so they've been kind of musing about this planet X or planet 9. And then finally, what it took was two profs at Caltech who made a website for it. And the website was called Where's Planet 9 or something catchy like that. And then, of course, everyone and their mom decided, hey, let's, you know, planet 9 is out there. Let's go look for it. Um, and so this was, this is the hypothesis. I think this is probably actually taken from their website, actually. Um, okay. So there was this notion that there was this planet 9. It would have been, like, just crazy far away. How the heck are we going to find it? Um, they, uh, you know, Constantine Batygin and Mike Brown said we should find it using the good old-fashioned telescopes. You look for a little bit of reflected light from it. It'll be very faint. It will move. You'll find it eventually. Um, but I happen to have an office at, at the McGill Institute. I have an office uh, two doors down from a cosmologist. And uh, his name was Gill. And Gill... Um, came to me one day and said, hey, Nick, do you think we could see Planet 9 with a cosmology telescope, with like a, a telescope at millimeter wavelengths? So it basically looks like a radio telescope to you and I. Um, and I was like, uh, I don't know. And so I sat down and I like did some calculations. And I said, well, it doesn't look good. Like I think this planet would be uh, 2,000 times fainter than Uranus or Neptune. And he was like, that's great. Because it turns out Uranus and Neptune are so bright, that's what they use for their calibration sources. Like, that's essentially the lamps that they calibrate their maps using. They're so bright. And so it turns out detecting something that's like a few thousand times fainter than that is actually no big deal. And so we came up with, okay, this is an example of one of these millimeter telescopes, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Um, it, it looks kind of like a horn. Some of them actually look even more like horns than this one. Um, they're, they're very curious beasts. And so, and this is what we use for mapping the cosmic microwave background, okay? And so basically, our proposal was this, was you look at the cosmic microwave background, and this is all the afterglow from the Big Bang, right? So it shouldn't be moving. And so the notion was, if you look at this, and then you take a picture uh, six months uh, later, and then you go back and forth between those two images, you start noticing that they look exactly the same, except... If you notice up here, there's actually a little thing that's not the same, right? There's a little dot there. Whoa, whoa. There you go. There's my dot again. See that? See how it's moving? Right? It's moving because of parallax, right? It's, it's just like at the, as the Earth goes around the sun, if you take pictures six months apart, something that's in the foreground, like planet X or planet 9, is going to be, it's, it turns out, planet 9, as far as it is from us, is still closer than the cosmic microwave background. So you use basically the cosmic microwave background as, a, as the, the background, indeed. Um, and you just see the motion, the parallax motion of your planet against that. Okay? So that was our idea. Um, people have tried this. They've started trying it. Um, and it's possible that this telescope, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, is kind of the best telescope to do the job. And so it's just gotten upgraded. It's now the advanced at... ATC pull, because it can do polarimetry. Anyhow, it's, it's gotten like better hardware, and so we're hopeful that maybe if Planet 9 is actually out there, we'll find it. Um, okay, so that's basically, like Planet 9 is like the last thing in our solar system. I mean, there might be other planets out, out there along with Planet 9, but I mean, you know, we weren't even expecting Planet 9. So now let's go even further. So now we're going to talk about other stars. And so as you might imagine, I probably wouldn't have a job if the answer to this was no. Um, <laughs> And thankfully, it's yes. Um, and so here's, here's the number. So who remembers when Pluto was demoted? Yeah. We have one person thing is 2007. I think it was that. It might have even been earlier than that. I don't know. Maybe it was 2007. I know I was in grad school, for sure. So, two, I mean, but that was, you know, that's a five-year span. Um, it was somewhere in here. Yeah, it's all a blur. 
Um, yeah, so somewhere in here is where Pluto gets demoted, right? Kind of like the, the, the second half of the, of the 2000s, the knots, I guess. Um, and so you can see at that point, it was rather galling that the, um, the International Astronomical Union came up with a definition of planets, which excluded the fact that to that point, we'd already found, um, I think if you integrate under the curve, it was close to 100 planets that we'd already found at that point. Okay, so they basically came up with a definition that only works in our solar system. So they were kind of like snubbing all the planet hunters who'd been working hard um, and like had actually started getting some successes in the 90s and were actually finding planets. And then you see this thing goes up and up and up and it doesn't take a rocket scientist. In fact, my seven-year-old was like, well, hey, what happened then, right? Like why did, so you were really good at finding planets and now you suck. Um, and, that's, that's kind of true. I mean, basically what happened is we had Kepler, right? So the same Kepler um, that gave you the, the, the Kepler uh, input catalog, the kick 2000, blah, 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 whatever. Those two stars are going to merge and turn into a red nova that we were hearing about in the first half before the halftime show. Um, that, that Kepler mission also found just a whack load of planets. Um, and you know, its reaction wheels broke, and so the mission is kind of like hobbling along now. We're doing cool stuff with it, but suffice to say, even if its reaction wheels hadn't broken, it's not clear that it would have found that many more planets. So basically, this, this big thing here, this big spike in planets, is, is just the Kepler mission, really. Um, but that's okay, because NASA's working hard on things that are even better than Kepler. And so one of them is called TESS, okay, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey... Who knows what the other S is for? Doesn't matter. And yeah, I, everyone calls it TESS. Um, and TESS is going to be sort of like Kepler, except it's going to look for planets everywhere in the sky. It's going to look for the brightest, or looking for planets around the brightest stars in the night sky. Okay, so that'll be pretty cool. And so don't worry, you know, we'll, we'll get more planets, and then we're going to get another bump because of TESS, and then maybe eventually there'll be other missions. The Europeans are putting up one called PLATO, um, that will find lots of planets. Anyhow, so, so don't, don't uh, grieve. And in any case, I really don't care about the hundreds and hundreds of planets people find. All I care about are the ones that are very close by. Okay? Those are, because those are the only ones that I can actually study in detail. Uh, in case you're keeping track, last I counted it, we were up to close to 6,000 um, planets around other stars, right? So at this point, calling them exoplanets or planets around other stars is kind of silly, really. I mean, they're just, they're just planets. Right? In fact, most of the planets are out there, right? They're not in our solar system. And so I like to tell people that I'm a planetologist um, because I study planets. Um, and I'm not particularly biased towards our planet or the planets in our solar system. The only problem with planetologists is it sounds like, like a certain kind of doctor um, and, and it's just not catchy in English. Um, okay, so here's your sun. Uh, here's the Oort cloud, right? So those, uh, those icy bodies and Planet Nine and stuff are in the Oort cloud. And then this is showing us uh, going out uh, a grand total of six light years, okay? And you can see this handy dandy nearby star system, right? The Alpha Centauri system. So you got Alpha Centauri A, which is basically like the sun. Alpha Centauri B, a little bit smaller, redder than the sun. And then Proxima Centauri, which we're not even sure is like exactly like bound to these, but anyways, um, it's, it hangs out close to them for now. Um, and so Proxima Centauri B right now, as the name Proxima implies, is actually the closest star to the sun. All right? So given uh, these fantastic numbers of planets, you know, once you start finding a lot of these, you start wondering, hmm, I wonder if there's some of these in our backyard, okay? And so remember, it's in the first half of the show, when I, I yelled out that most Kepler stars are 12th magnitude, 12th magnitude, as you all know, um, is rather faint, okay? Uh, at least if you're going to try and do detailed characterizations of these planets, okay, it's, it's kind of on the faint end. Um, and so Kepler mostly found this, these hundreds and hundreds of, of planets that Kepler found were around faint stars. Not so cool. Not so interesting for me. So what you want to do now is try and find planets around these these stars here. So people have already thought they found a, a planet around uh, Alpha Centauri A. Does anyone remember that? That happened like five years ago. I was a postdoc at the time. It was a big deal, um, but everyone's already forgotten. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
Uh, I don't know what that means for like scientific communication. <laughs> Suffice to say, people have, have cried wolf before. So, um, so about five or seven years ago, people, planet hunters, thought they discovered a planet around Alpha Centauri A, and it turned out to be just an aliasing problem in their data. Um, and, but it took like a good four or five years to figure that out, which is unfortunate. Okay, but that, so that one got shot down like a year or two ago. Um, and then people found a planet around Proxima Centauri. Okay, now the cool thing with Proxima Centauri is that it's a red dwarf. So around a red dwarf, it's easier to find planets because it's a small star. Okay, and so if a planet, uh, you know, yanks on the star, well, basically, if you have a smaller star, it gets yanked around more. All right, and so they were actually able to find a planet orbiting Proxima Centauri that is habitable. Okay, well, habitable-ish, air quotes, right? It's habitable, i.e. it's about the size of the Earth, and it receives about as much sunlight as we receive from the sun. Right, as much Alpha uh, Proxima Centauri light as we receive from the sun. Okay, so here, artist impression. Okay, that's uh, the star. This is Proxima Centauri B. It's four light years away. It's on an 11 day orbit. Right, when you're orbiting a faint star, you've got to huddle in real close to stay warm. Okay, so this planet orbiting in 11, it goes around its star every 11 days, is we expect it to be roughly the temperature of the Earth. Okay, so potentially habitable planet. Okay, but we want to do better than that, right? I mean, this artist's conception is rather suggestive. It shows a lake here. I think that's a lake. It's something blue, right? And so, so we want to know, does this planet, does it really have habitable conditions, you know, or could we search for life on it, for example? So the challenge is that, is this 11-day orbit, right? The, this planet is ridiculously close to its star. Okay, and to put, out, to put in perspective how ridiculously close this planet is to its star, I've put our entire solar system, um, in fact, all the way out to Alpha Centauri, um, on a log scale, right? You've got to do this on a log scale because otherwise it's, well, you know, right? If you try and do this like not on a log scale, you end up in, in like, the, like really far outside the building. Um, so on a log scale, you can do this, right? And what I'm labeling here is the orbital periods of some typical objects. So the Oort cloud, right? So remember, Planet 9 out here maybe. Uh, about a million year orbital period, right? You go around your star and it takes you a million years. Um, Neptune, the, the last bona fide planet, 165 years. Still pretty long. Um, Mercury, the fastest thing in the solar system, the fleet footed planet, right? Named after a, a speedy god. Uh, Mercury, three months. It takes it three months to go around the sun. Okay? So basically, we don't have any short period planets, right? We have nothing in our solar system that's anything like Proxima Centauri b. Okay, Proxima Centauri b goes around in 11 days. And so for the rest of, of tonight, I'm going to focus only on these planets in there. The planets that we find orbiting other stars obscenely close to them. Okay, I'm focusing on those basically because we can study them. Okay, there's other kinds of planets out there that are really cool, but it's harder to study them. And so you can ask me about them later. Um, yeah, I love all planets, but for tonight, I'm just like focusing on like stuff we can do in the near term, and that's basically in there, interior to Mercury, right? So we have no analogs in our solar system. We have no idea what these planets are like. Um, so how can we study them? Okay. The, now, we often use, in, in astronomy for, for exoplanets, we often use this, this trick called direct imaging, right? So, like, there's this one light that's, like, shining down on me, and I'm like, I want to see if there's, like, people over there or if they're all sleeping. So I can just, like, put my hand like that, and I can block it out, right? And then I can see, nope, no, they don't look like they're sleeping. They look like they're actually paying attention. Okay. Um, and so I can block out the starlight, right? But the problem is, like... You could imagine if there was someone who was hiding very close, like someone up in the rafters hiding right next to that spotlight. If I tried to block out the spotlight, I would block out the person, like the ninja hiding up in the rafters. Okay? And so that's basically the same problem with, with Alpha Centauri uh, or Proxima Centauri. In fact, well, yeah, it's a big problem for Proxima Centauri because its habitable zone is in so tight. Okay? If I try and block out the starlight, I'm going to block out the planet that we think is habitable, and so I can't ever see it. Okay, and this is not likely to change in the foreseeable future. Okay, even like with better technology for that particular planetary system, it is unlikely we will be able to actually image the planet. Okay, so direct imaging is kind of out the window, at least for this planetary system. So what are we going to do? We're going to use a, a series of tricks. Okay, these are all just this is just like astronomical jujitsu. So 
We're going to use the fact the fact that the planet is super close to its star is is the that's the the bad thing, right? Because then it means you can't do direct imaging. Um, but we're going to use that to our advantage because if the planet orbits really close to its star, that means it's possible, not likely, but it's possible that it will actually pass directly in front of its star. Okay. And so we call that a transit, when a planet passes directly in front of its star. And when you get a transit, the starlight is going to get filtered through the upper atmosphere of the planet, and it's going to imprint molecules on it. Okay? So that's kind of cool. Um, and then the planet chugs along, da -da 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 -da, half an orbit later, it's going to pass behind the star. We say it gets eclipsed by its star. Okay? It's going to disappear from view. There's cool stuff you can do there. Um, and then in general, it's just going to go through phases, just like the moon goes through phases or Venus goes through phases. Okay? Um, and there's stuff we can learn from that. So now I'm going to go kind of sequentially through each of these and tell you the kinds of stuff we can learn to give you an idea of how we can hope to learn about planets like, like this habitable planet next door to us. All right? and, and for the record, as far as we know, uh, Proxima Centauri b does not transit as of yet. Like We don't have any evidence that it does. But we suspect, we know enough about planetary demographics that there probably is a transiting habitable planet like that transiting in front of a red dwarf star within 10 to 20 parsecs. Okay, so not terribly far from us. Definitely in the solar neighborhood. Okay, so transits. So, this is a famous transit. Uh, I suspect a lot of people in this audience probably saw it. Yeah, I saw it. My now seven-year-old saw it when he was about four or something like that. No, I I'm not sure if I'm doing the arithmetic right. He was small. He was small enough that he was looking through a telescope, and he was like, "Not." It wasn't clear that he was actually that he knew what he was supposed to be looking for. I was like, "No, no. That, like what you're seeing, that's the that's the sun. You want to see the little black dot that is the interesting part, but whatever. Um, the black dot in this case was Venus. Venus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mercury would be cool. Venus is cooler." Um, and this particular one, right, so, so transits of Venus occur in pairs, and there's a whole historical thing that I'm not going to go into, but it involves uh, uh, Captain James Cook and um, uh, trading uh, nails for uh, sexual favors and lots of, lots of weird things. Anyways, um, <laughs> But it has, to do, it has to do with the transits of Venus and trying to measure the scale of the solar system. It's a great, like, look it up on Wikipedia. There, there might even be a better place to look it up than Wikipedia. Um, but, but someone must have made a movie on this, but maybe they haven't yet. Anyhow, so transits of Venus were historically important because that's how we set the scale of the solar system. So before then, everyone measured things in astronomical units. They had no idea what the hell an astronomical unit was. They just knew the distance from the Earth and the Sun, and they measured everything. They used that as a measuring stick to measure everything else. But they didn't know how long that measuring stick was. Therefore, they had no idea how big Jupiter was, or the Sun, for that matter. They just, like, they knew they were some distance away. And then once they, knew, once they used the transits of Venus to measure the scale of the solar system, they're like, whoa, like, the sun's really big. Um, and, like, Jupiter is not as big as the sun, but it's also really big. It's, like, way bigger than the Earth. Um, anyhow, okay, so the point is transits, right? So a planet passes in front of a star. Um, obviously, for exoplanets, we don't actually resolve the disk of the stars like this. Our telescopes aren't big enough. Um, yeah, even our telescopes aren't big enough to do that. And so all we see is just this. So this is brightness versus time. And it's like, la-di-da, la-di-da, just star, star, star. And then, hey, the star got dimmer by uh, 0.08%. Ooh, it's not very much. Okay, so the star got like a little bit dimmer. Da -da -da. And then a few hours go by, and then the star goes back to normal. Okay, and then presumably if you wait long enough, okay, if, if this is an extrasolar planet, right, then it'll come back around and you should get another dip, right? It should be periodic. That's what you hope for. Right? And if you, once you see a second dip, you start getting excited, and then once you've seen two dips, you can say, well, the difference between those two dips must be the orbital period of the planet. I will make a prediction. That's what us scientists do, right? We try and make predictions. Um, so then you can predict when the next transit will occur, and if that third transit occurs, then you pop open the champagne because you found a planet. Okay? That's the way it goes down. So that's a transit. That's how people find planets. But it turns out transits can also help us learn about the atmospheres of the planets, too. 
Okay, and so here's an example. This is filter one. The atmosphere is transparent, right? So the, um, the planet's atmosphere is transparent. So what you're seeing here is like the disk. This is like the solid surface of the planet, let's say. Now, you go to filter two. The star looks, you know, slightly different, obviously, because it's a different filter. Hey, wait, wait. There, small planet, big planet. Small planet, big planet, right? Because at this wavelength, what's going on is that the atmosphere is actually opaque. You can't see through it. It's blocking the starlight. So the planet looks bigger, right? And so this is what transit spectroscopy is all about. We basically look at like how big does the planet look at different colors of light, at different wavelengths, okay? Um, so now I'm going to give you an example we did on GJ1214b. All the, all the planets have names that are basically that bad. Um, they're all named after, um, basically like the, so the worst planets are the ones that have like a random, like that are like a Kepler name or something like that. Like if, 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 if the planet gets named after a planet survey, a search for planets, and that usually means that no one ever gave a crap about it before, which means it's like a totally random star um, that is just very faint, okay? If the star has a dead white guy name like this, Gleesey, um, or Henry Draper, or something like that, then you know it's like, it's named after um, a star, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a brighter star. What's that? Beta. Oh, it's okay? Okay, cool. Um, I wasn't sure if I was like offending people. Like, I don't know, maybe it's like a descendant of Gleesey or something. Anyhow. Um, so anyhow, so these are, the, these are pretty good. The very best stars are the ones that have Arabic names, because those, like, those are like naked eye stars, right? Like the really bright ones in constellations all have Arabic names. And so those are like, if you find like, uh, uh, you know, Fulmohalt B was a big thing, right? Or, or, you know, you find something like Betelgeuse or... You know, any, any of these, like, famous stars, that'd be fantastic. Unfortunately, most of those are, like, giant stars and not actually good places for life. Um, but there you have it. Okay. Um, GJ1214b, it's 42 light years away, um, in case you care. This is the kicker. 1.6 day orbit, right? Wow! This thing goes around its star really fast. Okay? We used this telescope here, Hubble. You've all heard of it. Um, and here's, here's the data. Okay, this, I swear this is the only plot I will show you. Uh, but Laura Creedberg did a fantastic job, so I just want to like show you her data. So this is basically, um, remember we were talking about how big does the planet look, okay? The bigger the planet looks, that gives you data points high on this, is basically the transit depth. So big planets would be up high, and, and at other wavelengths, the planet looks small, it looks down, it, it would be lower, okay? So the point is, they took some data, they got all these gray dots here, and it looked kind of flattish, and they said that's sad because we expect this planet has molecules in its atmosphere, and if it has molecules, then the molecules will absorb, uh, absorb certain kinds of light and not other kinds of light, so it should look at the planet should look really big at some wavelength, because say water absorbs it, and then it should look really small at another wavelength, because water doesn't absorb at that wavelength, for example. Um, so that's what they're expecting. So these colored lines show the expectations, and they were not right. Um, so then Laura went and got some uh, Hubble Space Telescope time, she got those black points, and then she zooms in on them because they are flat. They are flat like Saskatchewan, okay? Look at that. They're, just, they're so flat. And so, the, again, these colored lines are the expectations for different kinds of atmospheres, methane, water vapor, uh, carbon dioxide, and you can rule out all of them. That's a little bit worrying, okay? Because it turns out, like, if you do an inventory of the gases that could possibly exist in the universe that could be on this planet, like, we've already ruled out hydrogen and helium, um, and now we're ruling out uh, water vapor, which is like the next most common thing in the universe, and, and then methane and carbon dioxide. This is kind of embarrassing. Like we found an atmosphere, but it's not made of gas? Or there's something else in the atmosphere, okay? So what if there's something in the atmosphere, um, right, to, to explain the fact that the planet size is independent of wavelength, we need something gray in the atmosphere. Okay, so, so picture in your head, there's something gray in the atmosphere. What could that be? Dust, ash. Dust, ash. Other ideas? Car exhaust. Car exhaust. That would be very worrisome. <laughs> <laughs> Clouds. I mean, so the dust and ash is, the, is actually the right idea. I mean, this planet's pretty hot. Um, and so actually some of the clouds people invoke on these planets is actually silicate clouds. Um, which is basically, so silicate is rock, um, and so you could actually kind of think of that as dust. Um, also uh, salt, um, so like uh, sodium chloride, 
right? You can actually make legit clouds at these temperatures out of that. So basically salt condensing out. So, so maybe in the future, instead of getting the fancy salt, the like fleur de sel thing, you will get salt from a planet like this. They'll just go and grab some from the clouds. Um, so anyhow, so those are the clouds. Right? We've also, we have discovered molecules in some of these atmospheres, but not in that one. That one is still flat as a pancake. Um, so all we know is that it has clouds, and we are now trying to characterize the clouds to figure out what they're made out of. But for other planets, we've actually seen molecules. Okay, so that's it for the transit. Uh, now, now let's talk about eclipses, planet passing behind the star. So here I'm introducing another beast. Uh, you may not have heard of this. This is the kind of the, like, the less well-known cousin of Hubble. So the Spitzer Space Telescope is an infrared telescope. Okay, and um, here another planet you may not have heard of, uh, HD, that's named after Henry Draper, um, dead guy. Uh, Henry Draper, let's see, well, he was rich, yeah, and so he gave money to Harvard uh, to like classify things, and then there was a lot of um, poorly paid women who weren't allowed to get degrees from Harvard who like worked under him and basically mostly invented like astronomy. Um, like, figured out lots of cool stuff about stars, and mostly didn't get credit for it. Um, okay, so this one's 63 light years away, 2.2 day orbit. Okay, so again, pretty freaking close to its star. Um, so, we're going to measure its eclipse. So this is like, if you, in Dreamland, if you had a telescope the size of the Earth, this is what you'd see. Uh, you'd see the star, you'd see the planet, it would pass behind it. All we see in real life is this blue box here. The brightness versus time, you get a dip. And by golly, it looks kind of like a transit, doesn't it? Um, but it's different, because during the transit, it was the planet passing in front of the star, okay? Now it's the planet passing behind the star. So now, when you get a dip, the reason you're getting a dip is because the planet is hidden from view for a couple hours there. You just don't see the planet. So that means the, si the, the depth of that dip, instead of telling you about how big the planet looks and it's the, the kind of the fluffiness of its atmosphere or whatever, this is actually directly telling you how bright the planet is, okay? You're learning something about the planet directly, about the day side of the planet, in fact. Um, so one of the cool tricks you can do is actually during, the, this is now, hey, wait, do 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 okay, look at that, it's imprinted in your brain, okay, the brightness versus time, astronomers call that a light curve, okay, that shape, see that, there it is again, okay, so the point is if you look, this part here is called the ingress, and this part here is called the egress, okay, the ingress and the egress What's happening is that the planet is actually gliding behind the star. It's being gradually eclipsed by its star. And so it turns out if you do essentially derivatives of this, um, you can make a one-dimensional map of a planet. And then you take a derivative of that, and you can take a one-dimensional map. And then you do some voodoo black magic, and you make a two-dimensional map. Okay? Um, it's called a regularization. And so now you have a two-dimensional temperature map of a planet, which is not bad, right? Because this planet... 63 light years away. So we have a really, really crummy day-side temperature map of a planet 63 light years away. Um, not particularly useful for anyone, right? No one's uh, going to be going there on their like club med trips. Um, in fact, you really wouldn't want to go there um, for reasons that will become clear shortly. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about phases, right? Because the problem with the eclipse is the eclipse was great. We made a two-dimensional temperature map of the planet, but only of its day side. And we want to know what's going on on the night sides, okay? So to check out the night side, we're going to do phase measurements. So here's, here's the obligatory video. So you got the planet zooping around its star. Uh, we, we don't actually get to see this. All we see is da -da 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 -da, brightness versus time, which astronomers call a light curve, again. So... That, you got a data point. Oh, there's a data point. Uh, well, that one's kind of off. There's another data point. Okay, so this, this um, video is actually from the very first attempt at making this measurement. Back then, we were very brave, courageous. So we basically got those data and we fit a line through it and called it good. Uh, nowadays, we do much better. Uh, we actually have continuous observations and we actually know what we're doing. But anyhow. Um, <laughs> So the data now are, are sufficiently good that we can really tell how hot the day side is versus the night side. Um, and actually, we can actually we can combine that phase, those phase variations, with the eclipse mapping, that kind of raster scan thing that we did during eclipse, and we can actually construct something like this. Okay? So this is the substellar point. So the sun is beating down right here. And the hottest point on the planet is a little bit east of the substellar point. 
Okay, it's about 1,200 Kelvin. This was the part about not wanting to go there on vacation, right? Like, it's like, it's a little bit hotter than Cuba. Um, so that's the hottest point of the planet. And you say, well, Nick, it's okay. Maybe I'll just go hang out on the night side. No, it's still very, very hot. Um, and so again, that's why the clouds we expect on these planets are weirdo clouds, right? These they get clouds of iron, iron oxide, i.e. rust, um, and silicates, all right? Okay, so this is the kind of uh, atmospheric characterization we, we can do, and it turns out we can do that for like a half dozen planets at about that le level of detail. Okay? And then there's about another 50 exoplanets for which we can do things that are like not quite that awesome, but close to that awesome. So we can say something interesting about the night side, I mean, mostly about the day side, sorry. Um, usually detect water vapor, say like the temperature is blah, 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 we think there's clouds, you know, kind of at that level. Global, again, this is always global pictures of these planets. Uh, we have very little local information about what's going on. So that's sort of where things are at now. Um, we have this really awesome telescope that's going to launch soon, in less than two years, okay? This is very exciting. So this is a NASA mission. It's the most expensive astronomical instrument ever. It's eight to, between eight and nine billion dollars US. Um, so rather expensive. And one of the four instruments on this telescope is being built here in Canada, okay? It's actually led out of the University of Montreal um, and, and the Canadian Space Agency, all right? Um, and so that's the nearest, it's called nearest, that's not, not like nearest, but it's an acronym, nearest. Um, so NIRIS, as we call it uh, in Montreal, um, is one of the four instruments on this, and it's built here in Canada. It costs like $250 million, I think, it's a spectrograph. Um, and it's, gonna, it's actually it's the only instrument on James Webb that is like, optimized to do exoplanets. Right? So it's optimized to do this kind of science. All the other ones are like optimized to like take pretty pictures of galaxies. Like the stuff people were showing earlier, you know, those like smashing galaxies and stuff, or looking at like really distant galaxies, right? Galaxies are great. They make good pictures. Um, but I don't care about galaxies. Uh, I want to study the atmospheres of exoplanets, and it turns out NIRIS is the best instrument for that. It was, it was really designed to do that. Um, okay, so here's James Webb. Ba -ba okay. So, so this is, whoa, it got wiped out. I'll tell you what this plot is, because I know, all right? So this is a simulation, right? So I've, I've been showing you these maps that we can make of hot Jupiters right now. Um, and it turns out with the James Webb Space Telescope, it's so big, right? I guess I didn't tell you how big it is. I just assumed everyone knows how big it is. It's really big, right? So the primary mirror is six and a half meters across. Whoa, yeah. And the, and the, and the here, wait, da, da, da. this thing here, which is basically to keep it cool, um, right, so that it, the sunlight doesn't hit it, um, is about the size of a tennis court, right? So you'd be hard pressed to fit this fully unfurled thing um, in this room, right? It's, it's rather large. In fact, it's problematic to even like run tests on this at, in NASA centers because when they try and unfold it, like it doesn't fit in the, in the big cryo vacuum tanks and stuff. Um, and uh, needless to say, it doesn't fit in a rocket like this either, right? So you fold it up, it's all folded up, and then you launch it into space, and then you do like origami in space. So you unfold. So, and, it's, and it's very high stress because it's held together with these little clamps, and the clamps have to explode to unlock, right? And if any one of them doesn't explode properly, um, you're hosed. Because you're basically like, you're like the Sigma Sade contortionist who gets like stuck in some awkward position. And there's no one out there to help you fix it. Um, we can't send astronauts out there yet. Okay, where the heck was I going with that? Uh, da, da, da. Oh yeah, sure. So this is a simulation of what we hope we could try and do with James Webb Space Telescope-ish. Okay, this is, this is a little bit on the optimistic side. Okay, but this is what um, a habitable Earth would look like. So go back to the beginning of my talk, where I was motivating this with, with Proxima Centauri b, this, this habitable planet next door to us, and we want to try and characterize it. Well, it turns out when you orbit your star only every 11 days, you tend to get tide locked to it. Okay, so that means you have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. So that kind of, it's, it's an interesting notion. It basically means that geography and time of day are sort of intimately linked. So if you really like romantic sunsets, you can just choose to live a place where the sun is always at the same place on the horizon. Um, in fact, the sun is always the same place on the horizon no matter what. Um, and so this point here is always directly underneath the sun. So that's the substellar point. This side here is the day side of the planet. It is always the day side of the planet. It has been for billions of years. Okay, um, 
And so what you see is the night side is a bluish color, which means it's cooler, right? So again, this is a simulation because James Webb hasn't launched yet, so I can't show you real maps, okay? Um, so the night side is cool, and what's going on here? Okay, the day side mostly is this kind of warmer greenish and yellow, so the day side mostly is warm, but then right at the place that's directly underneath the sun, right? This is this part of the planet, the sun has been overhead for billions of years, and yet that, wow! <laughs> wow! Chris, help! Chris is going to help. Thanks, Chris. Um, right, this point, which should be the hottest place on the planet, is actually about as cold as the night side. Okay, so what the heck is going on there? That's like, that was weird. We saw this in simulations, we were like, what? Like, we did something wrong. And we re-ran them and re-ran a bunch of them, and then eventually convinced ourselves this is for real. Okay, and so what we were seeing is actually this. Right? These are big anvil clouds, like you get in the Earth's tropics. Okay? And so these actually, you know, we think we will be able to see these, we will be able to detect these in exoplanet atmospheres, okay? using the James Webb Space Telescope. And the neat thing with that is that clouds, if you haven't heard, are one of the big sources of uncertainty in climate predictions here on Earth. All right? And different people who run different global climate models actually make slightly different predictions for what we should see on these tidally locked exoplanets. And so this is one of those weird, like, full circle things where by studying, you know, a tidally locked planet and trying to make a map of the temperature on it, we might actually learn something about the clouds that we have to live with here on Earth and how those are going to change in the future uh, as a result of, of, of anthropogenic climate change. Um, so with that, I'll put this up, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Is, is this the right thing? Should I take questions now? Yeah. Are you okay? Can I do some more afterwards? Yeah, sure. Because we're just going to take a few right now. Yeah, sure. Are you coming to crises? Uh, I, maybe, yeah. <laughs> so we're only going to take about five questions or so because we're pretty tight on time. But if you'd like, uh, once the meeting is officially over, you can ask him your questions yourself. Yeah. Yeah, have you yet seen any climate variation on these planets over the years due to the changes in the brightness of the star, the way we do with our planet? Oh, gosh, uh, that would be way too subtle. Um, I mean, even, even in the solar system, this is, it's, it's uh, like you're talking about, like, due to, like, star spot variations or something. Sunspot cycles. Yeah. Yeah, those are pretty short. Those are, like, 11 years or Yeah, yeah, no, our precision, so the temperatures that we measure are only good to, like, right now, they're only good to, like, plus or minus... 50 degrees Kelvin, something like that. So we're like, those are the, in the best case. And so it's, we, we are long from being able to do that. That said, some of, these, some of these stars are way more interesting than the sun. Some of these stars are actually pulsating stars. Um, and so in those cases, we actually have a hope of detecting something interesting. Yeah. So you said that you, you can detect certain molecules in the atmosphere and, and uh, evidence of clouds, can you mm -hmm. detect evidence of a magnetic field? Magnetic fields are really hard. Um, a lot of people have searched for them, so you can look for aurorae um, on these planets, so exo aurorae. Um, it's not crazy because we <coughs> we know from from the solar system that that we expect these planets to have stronger aurorae than we get uh, on Earth and probably stronger than on Jupiter. Um, but people have looked for them, including me, and, and so far, nothing conclusive. Um, so that's, that's the best bet for, for doing B fields, yeah. You said that James Webb will actually help measure the composition of atmospheres on planets. And I realize you want to stay with the big picture and not get down into details. Mm -hmm. However, planets will probably have moons. Mm -hmm. Moons have compositions which are not necessarily identical to that of the planet. Mm -hmm. How do you propose separating the composition of the planet from the composition of its moons? Mm. So, we're, well, so far, we, there's no evidence that any of these planets have moons yet, and people are actually searching for them. So, so it's possible that the way you make these really short period planets precludes moons in the first place. Um, that's, that's one of the going hypotheses. Um, Alternatively, it could be some of them have moons that are too small for us to detect. 
Um, turns out if they're too small for us to detect through transits, they're also too small to matter for atmospheric characterization. Um, the moons become very important once we get to the, to the stage where we can actually do direct imaging and block out the starlight and see a planet, then you absolutely do have to worry about, about moons. That's sort of a different regime. Um, so, so we do worry about that for next, next generation missions, but not for James Webb. So is there a point um, where a planet is too, becomes too close to, this, uh, to this, uh, this star where an atmosphere is no longer possible or clouds are no longer possible regardless of the material in the clouds? Yeah, uh, it sure does. It depends, on, uh, it depends on how big the planet is. So for like a planet the size of Jupiter, you can be pretty freaking close, right? So uh, we have a few, there's about a, a half dozen of these planets that orbit in less than a day around their star, and they're just fine. Like you can see, they are losing hydrogen, right? Like you can actually measure that, that you can see that they're, that they're bleeding off hydrogen, but they're, the Earth bleeds off hydrogen, right? It just does it at a sufficiently slow rate that it doesn't matter at all. Um, it's the same thing with those planets. Um, however, if they are smaller, they have weaker gravity, and then they can potentially lose their entire atmosphere. And so we actually think there's a class of planets that's conspicuously absent very close to their stars, these things called sub-Neptunes. And we think the reason they are not there is because they all lost their atmospheres and became what we now call super-Earths, basically something that's pure rock. So we think what we're seeing is actually the naked core of what used to be like a Neptune-sized planet. Um, but, yeah, that's the current, that's our best guess right now. Okay, one more question. Who's the lucky? There's someone, wait, oh, there's people in the back. See, I can't see them because of the lights. I'm sorry, people in the back. Hey, Nick, great, great presentation. The uh, uh, Hubble Space Telescope has been up a few years now. Are you finding anything now where you're scrambling to go back and see uh, mine uh, data that's already been uh, hoisted in by, by Hubble? Um, Is there anything useful in the past of Hubble that you can... Well, not the distant past, but that's just because the, the, uh, at the risk of offending any like Hubble aficionados here, the, the first really useful instrument on Hubble was WIFC-3, um, uh, so Whitefield Camera 3, that, that went up fairly recently, right on the last uh, little fixer-upper they did on, on Hubble. And, um, and WIFC-3 has some grism uh, modes that are particularly useful for us, um, and there's they they are like a, an order of magnitude better than anything Hubble ever did before then. But yeah, there's a lot of public data from this Grism mode on WIFC3, and and I routinely exchange emails with colleagues where we're basically just going sifting through data that's already public. It's already on the archive. You all could download it if you want and to deal with Grism data on your computer. Um, and, uh, and you could analyze it and you can totally find cool, you can do cool science. Yep. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Nick. So for, for those of you who still have questions, he will be available for the rest of the evening. Uh, a member wanted me to point out a website called planethunters.org. And how that works is that you can go through the data of these telescopes that he's mentioned, and you can try and find those dips, and you can try and find your own planets. And when you do, you signal it, and they'll check if it's real or not. So it's called planethunters.org. It's open and available to everyone. So we're going to just zip through the last final announcements. Estelle's pick of the month, Visual Astronomy of the Deep Sky by Roger N. Clark. What it is is a handbook for both beginners and amateurs of uh, stargazing. It really just covers the important galaxies and nebulae that are visible to us. So it's really like a, a visual atlas, a bit like a, a map, and there are lots of drawings and photos. So. I'll let Janet speak to this. <coughs> Janet? Well, you just speak from here? Sure. Um, it's just uh, Gordon and I are presenting again our workshop on art and astronomy. It's going to be through the Ottawa School of Art, the Orleans campus. Um, I think it's March 3rd to March 5th. It's a workshop. Um, 
You'll learn some very basic things about uh, photographing the night sky. We actually take people out to Petrie Island if it's uh, uh, <coughs> a cloudless evening, and uh, uh, we do uh, a number of different uh, uh, artistic media for interpreting the night sky. And, uh, that piece probably took me over a thousand hours. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a work of fiber art. And it's the one that Brian was referring to earlier that I did. Uh, um, it's on view right now at the Mississippi Valley uh, Museum in uh, Almont. But the workshop uh, um, uh, deals with uh, basic photography and uh, also sketching of the night sky. People are interested talk to Gordon or I uh, after the meeting. All right, so March 3rd, 4th, and 5th, if you're interested. So another talk taking place, uh, courtesy of the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club. This talk is given by Howard Simcover, who is a long, long, long time member of the Ottawa Centre. So the talk is taking place on March 14th at 7.30. I believe it's at the Experimental Farm. As you can see, it's named Meteors and Meteorites, Rocks from the Sky. So it's all about meteors, how they work, how they affect us. So membership benefits, I have sped through that. We obviously, well memberships, youth memberships, $45. Our regular memberships are $75 and families $70, $11 an adult, $5.50 for youth. And the benefits include uh, subscriptions to Sky News magazine that will come afterwards. You have access to the Ted Bean Loan Library, to the Fred Law Singh Observatory, um, and of course the Stan Mod Book Library. And there you go, you have Sky News, you have the RESC Journal, the Observer's Handbook every new year. And you do also get access to Astronotes, which is our uh, monthly newsletter. Club information. Just a reminder that the, the flow director position is open, if that interests you. And as usual, the meetings are webcast on Ustream at the channel RASC Ottawa Live. So audience 132, not bad. Um, so thank you to all our speakers. We did have quite a few tonight. And as usual, we're going to Gracie's for a post-meeting meeting. So that's just down, just down Aviation Parkway, turn right on Ogilvy Drive, you can't miss it. I think Nick will be there. No, no promises, no pressure. <laughs> so the next meeting, March 3rd, at 7.30 as usual right here. So thank you for coming everyone. I really hope you enjoy. <laughs> And thank you to everyone who joined us on live. Okay. Have a good night. See you at Gracie's.